All right, good evening, everyone. We've been called to order at 5.02. Uh, the MVUSC Board of Education is holding a regular virtual board meeting tonight that all can participate in remotely. You can join via Zoom. Specific directions on how to participate are located on the Board of Education webpage on the district website, mvusd.org forward slash board. The open session part of this meeting agenda begins at 7 p.m. Before going into closed session, the board is available for public comment on closed session agenda items. Is there any public comment on closed session agenda items? There are no public comments at this time, President Martin. Okay, seeing that there are none, the Napa Valley Unified School District will now adjourn into closed session. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Isela Martin and this is the Napa Valley Unified School District Board of Education. The MVUSD Board of Education is holding a regular board meeting tonight that all can participate in remotely. You can join us via Zoom. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Isela Martin y, como, y somos el Consejo Escolar del Distrito Escolar del Valle de Napa. NBUSD por sus siglas en inglés, la Junta Regular del Consejo Escolar de NBUSD donde se puede participar remotamente, se puede unir vía Zoom. Interpretación, oh, excuse me, interpretation in Spanish is available for tonight's virtual board meeting. To access interpretation from, our co from a computer, click on the interpretation icon on the button on your screen of your, from within the Zoom application, excuse me. On a mobile device, click on the more button on the bottom of your screen and choose language interpretation from within the Zoom application. This is a separate channel that will allow you to hear English to Spanish translation concurrently. Please note interpretation services are not available when you join our meeting by calling in. Our interpreters for tonight um, are Marcy Valdivieso and Julie Young. Marcy, please translate these directions on our English channel so our Spanish speaking families can hear the instructions. Buenas noches, eh, somos sus intérpretes, estamos ofreciendo servicios de interpretación ocupando el canal de interpretación eh, disponible utilizando el icono de Mapa Mundi en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Puede seleccionar servicios de interpretación donde podrá escuchar interpretación al español simultánea, mientras que en el canal principal se escucha en inglés. Eh, Muchas gracias. De nada. Specific instructions on how to participate in the meeting are located on the Board of Education webpage on the district's website, mvusd.org forward slash board. Can we please start? Can we please start with an attendance roll call from Vera Morales? Yes. Trustee Martin? Here. Sorry. Trustee Gonzalez Mares? Present. Trustee Jankowitz? Present. Trustee Water? Present. Trustee Hurtado? Present. Trustee Shank? Present. Trustee Gracia? Present. Student Board Member Magaña? Present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Napa Valley Unified School District Board Meeting. Public participation remains virtual, online only, due to the COVID-19 shelter-in-place order. We continue in uncharted territory as we deal with COVID-19 pandemic. As trustees, we have returned to the boardroom in solidarity with our staff, given that our school campuses are now reopened for our students. However, in order to ensure access to our meetings without any limitations during the persisting pandemic, we're continuing with online remote access via Zoom for the public and guests. I would like to thank our employees and families and the entire MVUSC community on how you have supported each other and come together during these unprecedented times. This meeting tonight is in accordance with the open meeting rules of the state of California per the governor's order. I'm going to start tonight with some basic instructions on how we're going to be using Zoom and involve the members of the community. All board members, all board of trustees and the superintendent are on video throughout the entire board meeting. From here in the boardroom, other staff members are present but by audio only. Members of, of the community will not be on the video and will be muting except during public comment. During public comment, any member of the community that wishes to speak must raise their hand using the raise hand feature in Zoom. 
You will be unmuted and will be provided three mi minutes to speak. There are two ways to make a public comment within the time allotted for public comment on an eligible agenda item. To comment by video conference, click the raise your hand button to request to speak when public comment is being taken on an eligible agenda item. When it is your turn to speak, your name will be called out. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comments. After the allotted time, you will be remuted. Instructions on how to raise your hand are available on the district website at mvusd.org forward slash board. To comment by phone, you'll be prompted to raise your hand by pressing star nine to request to speak when public comment is being taken on an eligible agenda item. When it is your turn to speak, the last four digits of your phone number will be called out. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comment. After the allotted time, you will then be remuted. Instructions on how to raise your hand by phone are available on the district website at mbusd.org forward slash. In addition, community members were allowed to submit comments via email at public comment at mbusd.org up until 8 a.m. this morning. Public comment received after 8 a.m. the day of the scheduled meeting will not be read into the record. However, the public comment will be announced as received after the deadline and it will become part of the meeting's archive as long as it, it is received before the meeting is officially called to order. For every agenda item, I will prompt the meeting participants who have joined us via Zoom for public comment. Please follow the instructions just provided when you would like to comment on an item. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone for their patience as we continue to navigate this new technology. We have been called to order and conducted our attendance roll call. We will go forward with our agenda. And our report from our closed session items. D2 personnel in closed session the board took action to approve the following staff recommendation. Effective 2021 school year to the following administrative, administrative appointment has been made. Uh, uh, Kristen Tekel to the position of Director One Nutrition. Welcome, Kristen. Does that conclude? That concludes my report. Thank you, Robin. All right, and now for a flag salute, we'll have Mr. David Gracia lead us. Everyone could please rise and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, David. This meeting is recorded for live streaming and archiving on the district YouTube channel. For a detailed review of any meeting agenda, agenda item, excuse me, the archive video can be referenced, located on the district webpage at mvusd.org. The public can join the virtual board meeting re remotely via Zoom. Participation, instruction, and the process for public comment can be found on the district webpage. E4, approval of the agenda. So moved. A second. A first by Mr. David Gracia and a second by Ms. Gonzalez Mares. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Student body? Aye. Motion passes. Approval of minutes, which is E5A. So moved. Second. Do we have to break it up? Because I think you were missing one of the meetings. Maybe the 29th. So I will have the approval for October 10th and October 15th, a first by David and a first by Elba Gonzalez Mares. A second. a second, excuse me. Is that okay? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions? Nays? Student body? Aye. Okay. Now I'll move for the 29th. A first by Mr. Gracia and a second by Mr. Hurtado. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Myself? Student body? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. 
F, recognition of student of the month. F1, Vintage High School, September, Logan Nothman, and October, Josephine Borsetto. Recognition of Student of the Month sponsored by Napa Valley Education Foundation. Can you, Ruiz, can you advance the slide, please? Are you ready, Dr. O'Connor? Um, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'll just start by saying that my September and October um, board students of the month were flipped for a second, so I'm just doing a little shift. All right, here we go. Good evening and thank you, Dr. Musetti and the NBUSD Board of Education and the Napa Valley Ed Foundation. It is with extra extraordinary pride that I present to you this evening our two board students of the month. This continues to be one of my favorite aspects of high school principalship, even in the era of Zoom. I come to you tonight via Zoom, but I am happy to also report to you our successes at Vintage High School thus far in phase two. Having students back on campus, even for half days, four days a week, has breathed life back into our work. The work of phase one and now phase two is some of the hardest I have done as an educator. It has never been more apparent to me that I'm in this business for students. And in their absence, this hard work is, not just, is just not as fun. Speaking of students, I have the uh, honor this evening of presenting to you two incredible senior crushers. Their reflection for you of how their teachers, coaches, and adults of NVUSD have impacted their journey, sparked their passion, and guided them through challenging moments in their development is a reminder of how important our collective work is as a school district, not only in teaching students, but in growing and nurturing human beings. Our September board student of the month is Logan Nothman. Logan maintains the, an academic GPA of 4.71, which translates into never earning less than an A in high school and ranking in the top 10 students in his graduating class. But Logan doesn't just perform in the classroom. At Vintage, Logan is a star on the, and a leader on the court and on the field. Logan has played basketball and baseball all four years at VHS and is the captain of the basketball team. His leadership in sports and his solid thinking skills and his ability to connect with almost anyone makes him a valuable member of our athletic leadership council. Logan plans to take his talent and skills to UCLA, USC, Michigan, or Georgetown next fall and major in biochemical engineering as well as business and marketing. I asked Logan for a fun fact about himself that he was willing to have me share with this Zoom room. He said that in his free time, he enjoys most spending time with his family and friends. That's a pretty great response for a high achieving, athletically talented 17 year old. I'm gonna turn it over to Logan now. Thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Massetti, NBUSD Board of Education, Napa Valley Education Foundation and District Administrators. I'm honored to be here before you and to receive this award. In short, my experience in NBUSD has been beneficial. I feel that I'm as prepared for the next step in my education as any senior can be. There are countless people throughout my almost 13 years in the district who've helped shape my academic success. Tonight, I'd like to use the moments I've been allotted to share my gratitude for three of the people who've had the largest impact during my experience in MBUSD. I'd like to first talk about my seventh grade science teacher, Mr. Albertazzi. For me, he was one of those teachers I could always stay after class with just to talk with. We'd often talk about sports, and I think the little knowledge I have of lacrosse is all because of him. But more importantly, I attribute him to sparking my him to sparking my interest in science. Now, five years later, I'm applying to college as an engineering major. Mr. Albertazzi's class was one I looked forward to every day. I asked more questions than anyone else in his class, many of which stretched beyond the curriculum, but he never shunned them away. Instead, the thorough answers he gave only fueled my curiosity. I haven't seen him since I moved on to high school, so I guess this can serve as my thank you for helping me discover my academic niche. Next, I want to thank another one of my teachers from Silverado, Ms. Wyman. As my leadership teacher in both seventh and eighth grade, there was never a dull moment. I think she's greatly responsible for my willingness to express my thoughts and opinions, and this has been huge in both the sports I play, basketball and baseball, as well as in the classroom. But on top of this, I'm thankful for her class because she opened my eyes to the world beyond Napa. Ms. Wyman taught her students about children less privileged than us. In fact, in my two years with her, our classes raised enough money to build a couple schools in Ecuador. Today, I think my empathy for people I've never met influences my views a lot, and I'm not sure all my fellow students have the same perspective. 
I may not have realized this at the time, but I'm now grateful for the frame of reference I was given by Ms. Wyman back in middle school. <laughs> Lastly, I want to speak about my 10th grade English teacher and baseball coach, Mr. Anderson. Calling him that feels strange, so I'm going to stick with Rich. Since I've met him, Rich has urged me to focus on my duties as a student just as much as my duties as a player, if not more. On the baseball field, he made sure I was aware of the weakest components of my skill set, and I think the same was true in his English class too. But Rich has been more than just a teacher or a coach to me, and I know this to be true for all his other players who want that to be the case. He's helped me navigate many difficult decisions, one of them being prioritizing basketball over the sport he coached me in. When I was gloomy because of a broken leg I suffered last basketball season, Rich always made sure I kept my head up. He's a person who genuinely wants the best for me and for all his players and students, and I'm deeply grateful I always had an adult at school like him to lean on. Of course, I've had numerous other teachers and staff members who have been influential throughout my education, but in being asked to choose three of those people to recognize, the ones here today were my most obvious candidates. I'd like to say thank you again to everyone here tonight for your time and for bestowing me with this award. Thank you. Vintage's Board Student of the Month for the month of October is Josephine Borsetto. Josephine is heading into, her, heading into her senior year at Vintage High School and is ranked first in her graduating class. Her straight A's to date, the five AP tests she has already passed and the five AP classes in which she is currently enrolled translate into an academic GPA of 4.90. I think this might be the highest I've ever seen. When Josephine isn't attacking the books, she finds time to be a three season varsity athlete. She runs cross country, swims for the swim team, and participates in track and field. Additionally, Josephine is involved in her school and community through Vintage's Teens for Change and Community Ambassadors Club. Additionally, she teaches Sunday school to St. A's kids and volunteers at the Napa Valley Marathon. Josephine's work experience includes interning for a local neurologist roughly 10 hours a week, performing post-stroke surgical procedures on rats. Given this is her interest, it's not surprising she hopes to attend UCLA and major in biochemistry. What I did not know until I connected with Josephine to prepare for this evening is that she is in the midst of attaining Italian and Irish citizenship and that she names her cats after US presidents. While I may not have known about Josephine's soon to be tri-citizenship or her presidential felines, something I do know about Josephine is that she's not a big fan of speaking in front of large groups. I told her there are only six, six of you out there tonight on Zoom. I'm kidding, I was honest with Josephine. Josephine has a solid streak of shyness, but she's also never shied away from an opportunity or challenge. With that, I'll turn it over to Josephine. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. O'Connor. Hello, Superintendent Musetti, MVSD Board of Education, Napa Valley Education Foundation, and District Administrators. I'm so grateful to be here tonight and accept this award. I have loved my time in the NBUSD School District and want to take this time to thank three people who have made it so special. First, I'd like to thank my cross country coach, Shari Costanzo. She was the first member of the Vintage High community I met. And from that moment, I knew I was gonna love my time on the team and at Vintage High School. The past four years, she has planned weekend community runs outside of school and Zoom cooking sessions when we weren't able to see each other in person. She has become more than my coach and is now one of my best friends and role models. Her 900 day running streak is amazing, but not as amazing as her ability to make everyone around her feel welcome and confident. She goes out of her way to put a smile on the faces of others and lets them know that she believes in them even when they might not believe in themselves, something I hope to do for the rest of my life. I am forever grateful for the inspiration and friendship you have given me, Shari. Thank you. Next, I would like to thank my computer science and physics teacher, Mr. Brochard. If you ever get the chance to meet him, you'll see right away how passionate he is about the subjects that he teaches. Every day in class, Mr. Brochard jumps up and down shouting computer science laws or physics formulas so that even if we don't wanna do them, they're exciting. Mr. Brochard is also an extremely hard worker. Even after 16 hours of his weekend spent grading our tests, he still makes time to come to school early and answer our questions. This hard work inspires me to put just as much effort into my own schoolwork. 
and for this I have become much more successful and feel so fortunate. Thank you so much, Mr. Brochard, for encouraging me to be extremely passionate about my work, just as you are yours. Finally, I'd love to thank Mr. Engel, my AP Biology teacher. Going into junior year, I hadn't planned on taking AP Bio, but I'm so happy I did because it became my favorite class ever. Mr. Engel's enthusiasm for things like L cell energy cycles, even at eight o'clock in the morning, made me excited about biology too. He always went above and beyond, getting to school early and staying up late to finish our lectures, adding in little facts that he thought were cool to keep us engaged. And even though he was busy, he always made time for us to ask questions and get help on homework. He held us to high standards and I couldn't, and I could always tell that he was proud when the light bulb went off and we finally got what he was saying. It was those experiences in your class, Mr. Engel, that opened my mind to the possibilities of where I could go with my life. You gave me the courage to take the AP exam and get a five and look to biology as the basis for my studies in college. I will always be grateful. Thank you. And if I can squeeze in one more bit of gratitude, I want to thank you, Mrs. O'Connor, for showing me how to be courageous, tenacious, caring, and kind. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations to Logan and Josephine. We continue with Napa Valley Independent Study. All right, good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting us here tonight to share two of our outstanding students with the Napa Valley Independent Studies program. Uh, our first student, our September student of the month is Osmar Mendez Vega. Uh, he has the dubious honor of being the third person in his family to graduate from Napa Valley Independent Studies. He has two older sisters that have graduated and will be joining them as one of our alumni here this coming June. Osmar has been a student in the Independent Study Program for four years um, and uh, is also a student in our AC campus and was nominated by Mrs. Wilson, his teacher. So with that, I'd like to introduce to all of you, Osmar Mendez Vega. Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Osmar Mendez Vega, a senior at Napa Valley Independent Studies. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank my family for constantly supporting me throughout these tough times that we're going through. I feel like this year might have been my toughest one yet, but I couldn't have done it without them. Y sin que va Dios, sin mis padres y hermanos nunca podría lograr nada. I want to thank the school board, Super Superintendent Dr. Muschetti and Napa Valley Educators Association for this chance to be extremely honored as Student of the Month. The reason I came to this school was because I've heard about all the great things that this school has done for each student. And I'm here to tell you that they were all true. Being at the school has shown me how much one can really grow and learn from each other and from the teachers. NVS has prepared for me, for me for graduations and for life and after school. For example, Career Week has shown me what to expect when deciding on future careers, on how to apply, interview, and expectations on starting. I feel confident in this next step, and I thank you for preparing me, preparing me and us for this next step. I have been with independent studying since my freshman year, and when I was at the Napa campus, I've seen how much each teacher cares for each other's students. A year and a half ago, when the satellite campus at American Canyon High School opened, I made the change to attend closer to my home. And I would like to recognize my teacher, Ms. Wilson, for never giving up on me and her students throughout these years. Uh, she's shown me extreme kindness when I needed it the most. When I'm frustrated, mad, and want to give up, she's inspired me to keep going and to never stop until the job is finished. She's always making sure that each and every one of her students is doing well in their classes, and she's shown us many of times how she's always ready to help in, uh, in any way she can. And for that, uh, not only do I thank her, but every single one of her students do, does too. My plans after high school is to work in the trade industry, doing HVAC and R, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and, and refrigeration. I think that's a necessary job that can benefit me and the community as well. So I'm truly honored to be able to be student of the month. I thank you for supporting all the students in independent studies, recognizing that the, that the dedication and hard work to succeed is indeed possible. 
hope everyone stays safe and healthy throughout these tough times. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our October student of the month is Reina Maciel Nunez. And Reina is a newer student to our, our program. She started here as an 11th grader. Um, but uh, she has been very motivated and has put herself in position that she will be graduating this December. Um, currently, she is earning straight A's in all of her classes. And as you will, when you meet to her, meet her tonight, you'll see that she definitely has a plan for her future and what she intends to do. So with that, I'd like to introduce to you, Reina Maciel Nunes. Hello, everyone. It is an honor to be here tonight. I would like to thank Dr. Musetti and the school board for having me. My name is Reina Maciel, and I'll be speaking to you today about my time at Independent Studies. The first time I came to independent studies, I didn't, know, I didn't know what to expect. I remember having multiple questions and wondering if, with my condition, I would be able to graduate on time. I was excited when I saw my new counselor, Ms. Lewis, because she was my seventh grade science teacher. I told her about my situation, my fears, and letting her know about my struggles for going to school. Ms. Lewis gave me the confidence and reassurance that independent studies will help me thrive and help me go to the next level in my education. After the first day of school, I remember feeling proud of myself that I made it throughout the day. This was a huge accomplishment because it was right for me to finish a full school day with my help. I received a lot of support from the teachers and the staff working there. Everyone was very understanding about my situation and made classes flexible for my learning, motivating me to finish all my work and helping me move forward. I learned a lot from my teachers and became interested in topics that I didn't usually consider. Mr. Bimson's American literature class and Ms. Farrell's modern literature class made me realize that I was interested in learning about people's lives and what they went through to accomplish their goals. Ms. Lucero, my previous math teacher, never gave up on me when I didn't understand a concept. Giving my classmates and I examples and having practice problems helped me understand that in order to get good at something, I need to practice and never give up, even when I made lots of mistakes. Ms. Ganser, my economics and government teacher, helped me have more confidence in myself. I found myself engaging more and being open to new conversations. I saw growth from the times when I was in middle school to, till now, since I used to be shy and I would only talk when necessary. I am happy to announce that I'll be graduating early and without independent studies, I wouldn't have made it to where I am now. After I graduate independent studies, I plan to go to Napa Valley College and pursue a career in the medical field. I want to say thank you to my family for supporting me when times were rough and not letting me give up. The teachers and staff members at independent studies for always having a positive attitude and guiding me forward in my education. Finally, I want to thank Mr. Heron and the staff for choosing me for this honor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Felicidades Osmar and Reina. Uh, we move on to G, public comments on non-agenda items. Members of the audience may address the board on any school related matter that is not on the agenda. The board will not take action on any issue raised during the section of the agenda in as much as the board action is limited to the posted agenda items. Speakers are requested to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes. Do we have any public comment? Yes, President Martin, we do have a few uh, public comments. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Norma, Mark, Norma Ortiz. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. 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 Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, speak in Spanish and um, I could pause for the uh, simultaneous translation, please. Okay. Gracias. No, uh, Ms. Ortiz, we will not be doing simul um, 
Am I getting that right? Simultaneous translation. We would ask that um, English speakers please go to the interpretation channel. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hola a todos los presentes. Um, is welcome, this Ms. Ortiz. M Mr. Ruiz, can you please get the timer up, please? Is, is this um, also available for the board in English? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. It won't work. Okay, just figuring out the technology here in the boardroom for the first time, so my apologies. Yep. So we will have to do simultaneous. My, my apologies. Sorry, board members. So six minutes, Mr. Ortiz, and um, if we could uh, have one of the interpreters. Yes. Start now. Thank you. One, one moment. Oh, okay. Is one of the interpreters online? It says language interpretation has uh, has been ended by the host. And yeah, so it popped out. I'm Are here. I'm here, and I could oh. do simultaneous as long as everybody chose the language, because I could just switch to English. When I she could pause. We'll just do the pause because it won't. It it will not record the second channel, Julie. I see. Okay, so we'll do consecutive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I apologize, but I feel more comfortable speaking in Spanish. Thank you. No worries. And hola a todos los presentes. Hello, everybody. En general, le agradezco um, a todos su continuo trabajo y labor. Jerry, I want to thank everyone for your continuous work. In general, in general, les agradezco. In general, les, in general, les agradezco su continuo in general, trabajo. In general, I want to I want to uh, thank you all for your continuous work. Y labor con respecto a los diversos los diversos temas estudiantiles. And all your work and the different you know um, students' uh, issues or topics. Le quiero personalmente agradecer a Joe Shank. I personally want to thank Josh Han for haber asistido a nuestra primera junta DILAC de este año. For being um, at our um, being there at our first meeting for ELAC this year. El pasado 2 de noviembre. On November 2nd. Si bien es cierto. If it's true. Eh, como uh, lo mencioné en esa junta. Like I mentioned in at the meeting. Este sería mi cuarto término desempeñando tal rol. This would be my fourth term and serving in this um, committee. Role. On this role. Como miembro integrante de ELAC, DILAC. As a member of ELAC. DILAC. DILAC. En calidad de representante de una de nuestras tantas escuelas en el Distrito Escolar Unificado del Valle de Napa. And as a representative of all these um, in the, in the um, Napa Valley School District. In my quality of representative in uh, one of the different diverse uh, schools in the uh, Napa Valley Unified School District. Mientras que para otros padres de familia. Well, for other uh, parents. Este sería su primer año. This will be their first year. Quiero recalcar que basado en mi experiencia y conversaciones con otros padres de familia. I want to emphasize that based on my experience with um, some parents and other families. And conversations. Pude percibir que no todos venimos del mismo privilegio y estudio. I could notice that or sense that um, we not only come from the same um, privileges as um, you know, a bringing or education. Y me incluyo en este grupo. And I include myself in this group. Es por ello que en este espacio sugerí. Therefore, I suggested that in that space or in that space I suggested. Um, de la manera más atenta, entre otras cosas. In the most kindly way amongst other things. 
que se nos eduque y entrene de manera ecuánime a todos los representantes por igual. That we be educated in the same, and train in the same way as other parents. Equally. Con Equal. la finalidad de poder estar en una mejor posición de tomar decisiones informadas de relevancia en todos los temas de nuestros Can estudiantes. You? I know it's because the, the clock is going and the interpretation. Okay. Okay. Um, can you Con la make... finalidad de poder estar en una mejor posición de tomar decisiones informadas. With the goal of being in a better position to make a most more informed decisions. Informadas de relevancia en los temas de nuestros estudiantes e aprendices. Relevance to. Hello. Sí, de relevancia en los temas de nuestros estudiantes de aprendices de inglés. In relation to or relevant to our students that are learning um, English learners. Incluyendo lo referente a la estructura del cual siento. Including with reference to the structure, what I feel. Eh, no se nos preguntó o tomó mucho de parecer. We weren't taken in consideration as much. Siento que hay mucho por hacer. I feel there's a lot to do. Entonces, ¿por qué la prisa de implementar dicha estructura? So why the rush to implement such a structure? Además, en mi opinión, siento que le falta mucho más a la estructura que se pretende poner. Besides that, in my opinion, I think there's still a lot to, um, to add to the structure that you're trying to implement. Con respecto a DLAC. In respects to DLAC. Por conducto del equipo de liderazgo de este distrito. ¿Puede repetir? Por conducto del equipo de liderazgo de este distrito. Through the, um, uh, the uh, leadership uh, team. I'm just going to continue, Julie. I have 28 seconds and I feel the translation is Okay, there. go ahead. Y no I'll dudo switch de to que, Spanish. Y no dudo de que los objetivos pudieran estar ostentados de buena fe. El cuestionamiento hasta el momento de mi parte es el método. Ya que si bien es cierto, muchos de nos, nuestros representantes no entienden cierto vocabulario jurídico que forma parte de la estructura propuesta, como ejemplo, la palabra estatuto, conocido como bylaw, por citar solo algunos. En mi opinión, basado en mi constante interacción con los padres de familia y los integrantes de nuestra comunidad, siento que se necesita incorporar un lenguaje inclusivo con, lo, con glosario de términos con las respectivas explicaciones. Sigo repasando este documento y el plan maestro que solicité y tengo muchas preguntas por hacer. Y en muchas áreas siento que la información le falta precisión para poder exponer de manera eficaz toda la información que se manejan en estas plataformas a nivel distrito en cada una de nuestras escuelas. Debemos tener las bases de estructuras adecuadas y que todas las voces cuenten. Tanto de los que hablan más como de los que hablan menos. Me interesa bastante en mi calidad de padre de familia el rendimiento escolar y emocional de cada uno de nuestros estudiantes. Invito a todos los interesados a nuestra siguiente junta TILAC este próximo 2 de diciembre. Y tengo mucho más que decir, pero mi tiempo en comentario público está limitado. Gracias por escucharme y darle la bienvenida a mis comentarios. Thank you, Senora Nombra. Muchas gracias. I could try to summarize what she said, uh, but it was way too fast for me to um, keep track of everything she said. Board, would you like her to summarize? If you yeah. or if she wants to send us a copy of her um, comments or an email, she can email us our, her comments. Senora Norma. Um, si es posible que nos pueda mandar sus comentarios por correo electrónico y así de esa forma este, podemos distribuir entre los, um, entre el comité, por favor. Sí, y hago la traducción respectiva. Eh, lo, lo iba a hacer también hoy, pero quería tratar de ser lo más breve posible, pero voy a incluir la traducción respectiva. Gracias. Ok. I will Gracias, the, señora Norma. The, I would include, I'm going to include the uh, translation. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so do we just go back to um, yes, I'll, simultaneous? I'll, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll okay. switch you back over. Uh, we have Kim Whipple. Yes, hi, hello, this is Kim Whipple. Uh, to whom may concern, uh, please understand my passion for our youth of the Napa County. My letter comes to you as a fifth generation Napa, a teacher and as a mother. I cannot express my gratitude for your hard work over the last seven to eight months. This year has been an atrocious in all senses of what we know about general comforts of normal life. I cannot even grasp an understanding of the difficult decisions you have had to make or approve. I am sure you were overworked and underpaid. I'm sure you see the harm that COVID has caused in our community. And I'm sure you've heard the stories of the impacts it has had, and it must be heart wrenching for you. I would like you to know here what I know. These examples of what I know is based on my experience as a teacher of teens for 20 years and as a mother of 18 years. I know that our children are suffering unimaginable loss because of COVID. They've seen sickness and even some have seen death in their families. I know our children have seen financial burdens because of COVID. They feel the stress, they feel the concerns of what is next, and they hear the conversations from their families and they see the impact. A huge and impactful burden they bear is the social impact. The brain of a young person, especially that of 10 to 15 years old, is changing dramatically, so much that it can be compared to the changes of that of a newborn baby. Think of all the things a baby learns, sight, sound, touch, reaction, personal connection, etc. A teen's brain is learning so much, they are developing the identity of who they are, they're developing connections to social groups, they're developing decision making and loads of other critical aspects of being a human. It is ingrained in our DNA as humans to have connections. Our young people are losing valuable time in developing the neural connections in their brains that train them how to socialize and engage. These processes of neural connections are supposed to happen at certain times in their lives. If it does not happen, their brains become forever altered. I have an insane fear for our teens that they are losing their connections and that this impact will not allow them to develop connections later in their life. As we begin school this year via Zoom, there has been a definite loss of connection. The kids are not engaged. They do not respond. They are not mentally present. Our DNF rate is up nearly 30 to 40%. If you've ever sat in on a Zoom session from a regular education class, not an honors or AP, you can see the disconnect. Teachers are doing everything humanly possible to help these kids interact because we were on the front lines and see the huge changes in them. Now we've entered phase two for part-time school. It's heartbreaking to see the kids are walking around like zombies. We've given them little for seven to eight months. You can see the detrimental effects in their characteristics. They're pale and almost emotionless. I'm used to seeing vibrant faces, hearing laughter, watching harmless roughhousing, seeing excitement in their eyes. In the last two weeks, I've seen detached and whole human, cold humans. I see distant blank stares. I see unemotional teenagers. In the work that I've asked them to return, I read about their feelings of isolation, of stress, and of anxiety. I read of their longing to be with their friends, to interact, to engage, and their, to engage with their former social groups. Our California teens and our Napa teens are losing friends who choose to move to other states because life is beginning to resume in those other states. They see on TV and other media that teens are playing sports and getting to experience being a fan in the stands. I'm almost done. They see so many activities going on and this makes them feel even more isolated and alone. COVID is in every state, so why are we choosing to stay in some sort of lockdown when others are choosing to move ahead of life? Our kids need to move ahead with life too. Our children are dramatically changing. Yes, we fear COVID, but I, I wanna thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. Oh, geez. I have two, two sentences left. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Next comment, Mr. Uh, Ruiz. Uh, Kate uh, Aaron, Aaron, she is she, running a, an older version of um, of the Zoom app, so I can't I can't unmute her mic. Kitty there are Aaron. directions on um, on the Board of Education page on how to call in if you do not have the Zoom app. 
Oh, we should okay. Yeah. Okay, well, you can proceed, Mr. Ruiz. Yes, President Martin, that concludes our um, comments, public comments at this time. Thank you. We move on to H reports, Board of Education and Student Board Representative. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I have a couple of reports to give out tonight. Um, so luckily I've been um, uh, doing the hybrid in-person learning this past, I guess, almost a month now. Um, and my experience has been pretty, pretty good. Um, most of my teachers, or actually all of my teachers have been really excited to have students back in the classroom and um, having more of a physical presence. Um, uh, for those staying online, I think everything has kind of stayed the same, I would say, uh, but it's been really nice to kind of get back in the classroom um, for me personally and for my peers that I've heard input from. Uh, it's been extremely engaging. Teachers um, were doing their best kind of with online, but I think in person, they're just excited to have students in the classroom. So it's been nice to be with them and uh, build, building better connections with um, my teachers has been really nice. Um, as we go on to moving into the next phase soon, um, Dr. Musetti gave me a call this past week and we are looking to start um, some focus groups uh, at each school level in the elementary school, middle and high school, um, including all MVSD schools. Um, I will be helping facilitate some of those focus groups um, starting next week. Um, and we will be asking uh, all students kind of several questions about um, how their experience has been and um, what can improve and what's been great for them. Um, so I'm excited to kind of start that next week along with some of the uh, assistant superintendents. And that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, we will start with Mr. David Gracia. So on the 29th of October, I attended our first non-business meeting wherein we embarked on a three-year journey to celebrate all of our district schools. And then on the 10th of November, I attended the Facility and Technology Committee meeting. Since our last meeting, I have been interacting with many of my fellow parents. I have been hearing from parents with whom I share an interest regarding returning to greater in-person instruction. I would like to take this opportunity to address some of the concerns that have been shared with me so that the community can understand what has already been accomplished by our current phase two reopening and what we are currently working on. First, I want to say that NVUSD is getting kids back into school, and we are one of the leaders in this state at reopening schools. Dr. Massetti fields regular phone calls from other superintendents from around the state trying to figure out how we did it. We have blazed the trail to reopening where others have remained entirely virtual because we created a distance learning schedule that would allow for a simpler transition to back to in-person learning. We had always planned to return to in-person instruction and have since the beginning had that as part of our intent and goal. Because it was our plan all along to return to in-person instruction, this gave us a leg up on other districts who did not negotiate with their labor unions over the summer regarding these issues. We have another advantage that most other districts don't share, and that is a strong relationship with our labor unions. Due to our strong relationships, we were able to successfully navigate these difficult negotiations while other districts were prevented from reopening due to labor unrest. Having a bond was critical to our success in getting students back into classrooms. We used funds from Measure H to secure the technology necessary to facilitate both the distance and hybrid learning model. The hybrid model where in-person and distant students are taught at the same time was a critical component to our reopening of schools. Without the technology allowing for instructional flexibility, we would not have been able to reopen in the manner that we have. It would have necessitated a pared down course offering and much less flexibility for secondary students to move in and out of in-person learning. We blazed a trail by securing the necessary testing for our employees. It was not easy to secure sufficient testing as the county was originally unwilling to provide the necessary capacity for our employees to test at their site. We led the community in applying pressure on the Napa County Board of Supervisors and were able to secure testing at the county test sites for our employees. Being able to test our employees at the county test site has been a critical component in our reopening. 
Other districts are struggling to implement a reopening plan as they can't find sufficient testing in order to cover their employees, much less afford it even when they are able to find testing capacity. The county has been working collaboratively with us to facilitate the testing of our employees once they committed to it and have been helpful partners with us. Other districts are not finding similar partnerships with their county board of supervisors. Some parents have asked me how other states are able to return in greater participation. For those parents, I would suggest you need to understand how the different regulations from state to state surrounding the reopening of schools are. They're very, very different. California has some of the strictest guidelines on classroom reopening of any state out there. So comparing our situation in Napa to that of another state is not an equal comparison. If you want our state to behave like a different state, then you may need to consider voting in a manner consistent with that other state. Other parents have asked about smaller counties in California with smaller student populations that have reopened more than we have. The smaller counties have had significantly less coronavirus threat than we have. The uh, extremely rural and little populated districts have always been off the state's watch list or in the yellow slash orange level, meaning they have been operating well ahead of us due to the nature of their population and threat level. Parents have also brought up the Chico School District, which they see as a bit more analogous to NVUSD. That district is still significantly smaller than NVUSD by several thousand students, but this isn't the biggest difference between their reopening plan and ours. In Chico, the school population opted for a 96% return to in-person instruction, which makes planning for reopening a much easier uh, task to facilitate. They are also operating in the yellow tier of COVID threat level, while we are headed back to the red. The county health departments are more permissive and relaxed about rules when the COVID threat level is yellow, as opposed to when the level is red, giving the district more flexibility to move more quickly. In NVUSD, we have moved to stage two of our reopening plan, which allows for in-person instruction two days a week. This was a necessary step on our way to a more robust implementation of in-person schooling. It always was anticipated that we would need some time in phase two before we moved on to phase three. We were always going to work out the kinks in the system and refine our operations in phase two before moving to phase three. I hope that we will be able to move to our third phase as quickly as possible, but appreciate the need to plan the transition so that we execute it well. I ask that you bear with us as we do some of the strategic planning necessary to move us to the third phase. Please know that I share the belief of many parents that the social isolation is worse for the mental health of our children than the coronavirus threat is to their physical health and that we should therefore move to greater in-person instruction. We must, however, be cognizant that not all of our fellow citizens believe that in-person instruction is the way to go. A good 50% of MVUSD families have chosen to keep their children entirely in distance learning as a result of the pandemic. We must find a way to honor their desire to protect their children from the physical effects of COVID, while at the same time preventing those who see the negative mental health effects as outweighing the physical risks and want our children to return to greater in-person instruction as soon as possible. Finding a solution that works for all of our students and parents is not easy and slows the pace at which we can transition from phase to phase. I hope that I've been able to share with you a glimpse of how things are going so that you can better understand and appreciate the unprecedented work being undertaken by NVUSD in order to facilitate in-person instruction for half of our NVUSD population. I want to ensure you that the district continues to work on the plan to move our students forward to phase three, but they must have sufficient time to evaluate what is and isn't working well here in phase two before moving on to phase three. I'm personally looking forward to seeing the expansion of in-person instruction. Thank you, David. Mr. Jose Hurtado. Thank you. 
mentioned uh, under the sun, including uh, the back of the new person at the school. Uh, it's interesting that very often the, uh, the uh, providers of the center of the center don't conflict with you. So there's always one issue not complicated by the pandemic that we're going through. Well, then, um, uh, the uh, pandemic became all too real. As I told most of you, my son is a, is a high school math teacher in the independent school district in Dallas, Texas. He is currently being quarantined because one of the students on the public third day of in person uh, classes uh, has positive for COVID. So, Special and his wife are missing or can possibly be quarantined. He's fine, but uh, the dangers of uh, opening schools in a hurry uh, in home is to Thank you, Jose. Joe Shank. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I attended the first DLAC meeting of the year. Um, I took my first COVID test of the year. Uh, I attended the second author talk of the year, uh, which was May Vespicio, a Filipina author. I completed the Kendi book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. I read the research paper, No Spending Without Representation. The title was better than the paper. Um, on the face of it, it seemed like it would be more applicable to the work that the board does, but I was underwhelmed by the content of the paper. Uh, and I attended the Agricultural Advisory Committee supporting our CPE Ag classes. Thank you, Jill. Cindy Water. Um, I too attended the meeting on um, October 29th and uh, it showcased the American Canyon schools and Valley Oak, our continuation school. And I learned something. I knew that Valley Oak had one teacher of the year, one Napa County teacher of the year. I didn't know it had two. And um, so it was, it, that it was a great night. I liked it very much. I also, um, attended the author's talk by Mr. Respicio, and I don't know how it works out, but these um, children's authors all seem to be extremely attractive young people with a <laughs> wonderful manner. I mean, you can just see a, a classroom of young kids falling in love with them. They're just so engaging. And um, this one won the heart of the retired English teacher by talking about how much she needed to revise her work. You know, so um, it was it was really fun, and thanks to uh, uh, thanks to Pat Andrew Jennings, our assistant superintendent, for um, uh, working on that and putting it together. It was lots and lots of fun. Um, let's see. Last, oh, I took a ride down to American Canyon to check on the project process of the new elementary school, and it's just so great. It's going to be so wonderful, and I um, tuned in. I think it was, was it last night to, um, or the night before to uh, Senator Bill Dodd's uh, town hall meeting. Um, and Dr. Relucio was on it, but I'd just like to thank Senator Dodd for giving a, a shout out to Browns Valley School. He was full of compliments for um, how that school has handled their, um, their, uh, to their, um, what is it, Roomer and Zoomer instruction. He just said it was so much better than last spring and he was most appreciative of it. And um, I too have responded to emails and I even wrote a letter to the editor standing up for American Canyon, not that it needs my help, but I was happy to point out how um, those schools are really the center of the community. And uh, they're very, very, they're very important to American Canyon and of course, important to us because they're very successful schools. Over and out. Thank you, Cindy. Robin, thank you. I too fielded parent calls. I too took a COVID test today. I have young adults at home whom for the first time got to actively participate in the election process at the local, state, and federal level. 
I have enjoyed observing our youth. They have an emerging and distinct identity of civic activism. Uh, 239 million people were eligible to vote. The projected 161 million did. 66.8 projected turnout rate. And student voting surge. Barred students sued to get a polling station on their campus. RAs at the University of Pittsburgh use Zoom to register new voters. Students at the University of Wisconsin signed up as poll workers to help their fellow Badgers navigate some of the nation's toughest voter identification laws. What is my point? Our students' role in education is to learn what they are being taught. But more importantly, find a way to apply that knowledge outside of their school environment and into their everyday lives. Given the challenges education has faced over the last nine months, it is a nice reminder that education works. I too um, participated in the celebrating of our schools. It is a wonderful concept. It is a way for schools to celebrate who they are, how they serve their students, successful programs, and the students that bring each school to life. And I uh, once again loved author night. May engaged with the students and participants and spoke to how she was a reader before she was a writer. She said, reading is like a muscle. The more you do it, the stronger you become. And she, very much like our first author, didn't see anybody that looked like her in any of the books that she read. She was inspired to use family folklore and stories as the basis for her work. And through her writing, she brought those tales to life. Beverly Cleary, who many of you know, had a quote that resonated with her. If you don't see a book you want on the shelf, write it. Mm -hmm. And she did. And I too attended the, oh no, that's later, but I attended the facilities and technology committee <laughs> meeting that, that David will give a report on. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Edma Gonzalez Mares. Yeah, I think um, going last is a summary of all oh, we'll the participations <laughs> on my end, um, which is okay. Um, it, it, yeah, it, I think it's been a, a tremendous, um, it feels like years since the last time we had our board meeting. It feels like weeks feel like months and months feels like years these days. So um, just, you know, I think in reflection, um, really um, just appreciative of all the information being sent out by the Napa Valley Unified School District. I get it both in my uh, emails in English and in Spanish. And so, and, and that kind of going back to, I think that's one of the things that happened with COVID is that you can always go back to the video and um and look back at your notes and sort of revisit certain topics that because it's a lot of learning and i think that's um you know something that we're all doing together and just really appreciative of, of, of that so i just wanted to end with that note so thank you all i'm over here counting on my fingers how many months yeah because almost nine months so yes i'm really really happy to see everyone um, right now that I'm not in class, so um, I'm crossing my fingers I don't get bumped from my class because I really wanted to be here in person with all of you guys. <laughs> so yes, counting the nine months, it's been really long. Um, with that, I feel like I'm always opening up uh, my opening comments with, um, with how much the community has outreach. And I think that even during this, uh, the pandemic, our um, families have become more engaged, especially um, either their children, They'd like to give their opinion about what we're doing with um, whether it's online school or whether it's an in person. Um, I can't seem to catch up. I don't know if all my trustees, they never talk about that. And I, and I sit here, I'm like, how did they even find the time? They're not complaining. They're not saying anything, but I seem to answer three and then five pop up into, in, in my email. But anyhow, I get to them as quick as I can. And I wanted to extend that gratitude to all our families, especially during a lot of the interactive process of, um, of how much um, Harvest meant to them and also getting those thank you notes for putting a halt to kind of give us that moment to think about decisions and how to move forward through that. So I thank all of those families. We move on to uh, board representative reports, H2A curriculum and student support committee. We have not met. We will meet later this month. Thank you. Um, H2B Facilities and Technology Committee. Yes, we met on 11 10 20 under the technology section. We discussed the status of the MacBook Air distribution uh, for the approximately 700 MacBooks that we had previously purchased. Uh, they have just started the distribution. Uh, and those resources have been sent out to approximately 74 teachers so far. 
Uh, we have plans in the coming couple of weeks to really accelerate the distribution of these new laptops. Uh, we discussed a bit about the positive impact, the Promethean boards, iPads with stands, and Bluetooth microphones, along with the new laptops, is having on instruction throughout the district. Without these core technologies, we would not be able to offer the hybrid in-person and distance learning model that is the core of our reopening strategy. It has been the technology that allows us to facilitate the reopening of schools and has been key to the success we have been having so far. We discussed that there are a number of emergency radios that have been distributed to each site, but that the number of emergency radios doesn't necessarily cover the number of radios necessary for school operation. We are actively working on developing a standard through which we will assign additional radios to sites and may need to purchase additional radios to cover operational needs once we are clear on our operational standards. Uh, during the facilities portion of the discussion, we focused on two topics. The first was to review the updated Measure H implementation plan. In reviewing the report, it was evident that we had received uh, some funds from the state that we had not previously been able to include and therefore were able to stretch some of our dollars to include more items. We also had some discussion about the formatting of the report to the board and settled on a standard that provides more transparency in a way that the previous reporting did not. This should be reflected when this item comes before the full board in December. The second part of the facilities presentation was on extended general conditions. General conditions are defined as the costs associated with having a supervisor present at the project, having certain equipment present at the project, and also securing insurance for the duration of the time the construction is happening on the project. These general condition costs are all factored into the original contract by the construction company who bids on the project. A general extended condition crops up when the project goes long because of something the district did, like changing the scope of the project, or due to outside factors like natural disasters or COVID-19. When things go long, we must look at the daily burn rate of the costs incurred by the contractor for keeping open and then negotiate a reasonable amount for them so that they aren't losing money on the contract due to circumstances beyond their control. These provisions are included with every contract that we sign and are an industry standard. Delays caused by the construction company are not compensable and we do not pay for the days the project goes long because of delays caused by the contractor. And that concludes the uh, facilities and technology report. Thank you, David. Finance Committee? I'm not mad. H2D Policy Committee? Our advisor, Sean Cindy? Well, I don't think we've met we did. since the last meeting. We did? Yeah. We did, right. Yeah, we met at October 22nd. Right. I can give the update. Okay, you do it. I have my notes somewhere. Give me a second. Right, and here we are. Um, yeah, we, yeah we, did, we usually define who's going to do the update, and I don't think we did that. But yeah, we met on October 22nd. Um, you'll, it's, already, it's here on our board packet. Um, all of the CSBA July 2020 policy updates that are being introduced at today's meeting. Um, many of those include um, board policy around nutrition program compliance, um, a, a series around sexual harassment and the new Title IX complaint process, um, addressing infectious disease, um, some um, physical education, as well as um, individualized education programs. So we had a um, um, series of conversations around those updates that needed to be done so that we keep track with our policies. Um, as well as our inter-district open enrollment board policy um, and um, ended with the discussion of just other future agenda items having to do with food delivery and um, oversight over other fundraising that occurs outside of our school district. Yep. Yep. anything? All right. <laughs> that Thank concludes that report. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. H2E Special Education Community Community Advisory Council on Monday. Thank you, Jose. H2F City of American Canyon Liaison Representatives. We haven't met recently. Thank you. 
H2G, City of Napa Liaison Representatives. Okay, thank you. H2H, Town of Yauntville Liaison Representatives. We have still not met and do not anticipate a meeting anytime soon. Thank you. And this moves to H3, Superintendent and Executive Staff. Um, good evening, President Martin, NVUSD trustees, and the NVUSD community. Um, I'd like to start out with an announcement uh, regarding the state of the district event that is scheduled for next week. So if you remember, Napa Valley Unified School District adopted our strategic plan almost two years ago. That's really hard to believe. Um, so what about those strategic plan goals one through six that we've been working on for the couple of years that have served us so well, especially during this pandemic, although we could have never anticipated that in December of 2018 that the goals would be put to work in a pandemic environment. In response to what about those goals, I'd like to let everyone know that next Thursday, November 19th at 630, I'll be presenting the State of the District. This will be a live presentation where I will report out to the school board, staff, and the NVUSD community at large about the progress NVUSD has made on the six goals we laid out in our strategic plan, again, back in December of 2018. I'll report out on our progress, our accomplishments, and the work that we still have ahead Originally, we were planning for this to be a celebratory in-person breakfast event with administrators, staff, parents, and important community leaders. However, due to COVID-19, we've had to simplify our format and our plans. Despite the pandemic and our inability to come together to celebrate our accomplishments of the last two years, we still feel that it's important to provide a public report on our progress. The State of the District presentation will be recorded and archived for those who cannot attend live and a follow-up electronic report will be sent out to internal and external audiences later in December. So an invitation to save the date went out to our parents today um, and it's been announced as well to all NBUSD staff. I'd also tonight, um, this is sort of a lengthy report. Um, we've been, like many of the trustees said, you could tell we're obviously clearly discussing the transition in our reopening plan as we move through our four phase framework. Um, and you'll be able to tell as I report out on reopening, I'm um, trustee Grassi along with all the other trustees, it's clearly a topic of discussion. Um, you know, trustee Grassi as a parent obviously has a high interest in this topic. And so we've had a lot of discussions around this phase two, phase three transition. And we've all also had discussions around how proud we are as a, what, regarding what we've accomplished as an organization. As you heard from some of the trustees, Carla Magagna, our student board representative tonight, and you'll hear also from our assistant superintendents momentarily, NVUSD continues to lead the way in figuring out how to educate our students in these pandemic conditions that are lasting much, much longer than any of us could have imagined. Tonight, I wanna to provide just a brief update on our reopening plans and our assessment of our district's performance in phase two and our current position on moving into phase three much of this content will be just, um, shared with parents and staff in upcoming communications as we you know, move through next week and the Thanksgiving break. First of all, I wanna uh, let everyone know that I'm a tremendous advocate for opening our campuses for in-person hybrid instruction with health and safety as a top priority. I think NVUSD has demonstrated this advocacy by being one of the only districts in the Greater Bay Area to open all of its schools simultaneously across all levels on one single day um, at the high school level, the middle school level, and elementary school level. Uh, as Trustee Gracia mentioned, I, I have been fielding calls from superintendents across Northern California about how we accomplish this monumental task on October the 26th. I always start out my response to those inquiries with the fact that our team and this board were committed to reopening campuses with strict adherence to health and safety protocols in order to better tend to the socio-emotional well-being of our students. We know it's been mentioned in public comment in many of the emails that we've received and to create conditions for improved academic progress, all while keeping robust high quality distance learning as an option for students and families who view the virtual option as their best option. Let me highlight some of the contextual factors this accomplishment has occurred within. NBUSD prepared to open schools while our county was in the red tier, despite fires, poor air quality days, and evacuations happening in our community the entire month of October. 
we figured out an elegant solution to meet the needs of a divided community because the community is divided on whether to come to in-person instruction or stay in the distance learning format. It's not a perfect solution, but it has allowed for the hybrid option to happen. This is the simultaneous teaching hybrid model where teachers are having to navigate the complex environment with Zoomers and Roomers in the classroom setting. Our community remains split on their choice between in-person and distance learning options for a variety of reasons. We, we don't need to laundry list them here. Some families have highlighted that other school districts in more remote counties who recently opened dove into a five-day model, while in NVUSD we only began two days a week. I'd like to note that in these more remote counties, many of them are in the yellow tier, or were in the yellow tier, because 10 counties just recently reverted back to more restrictive tiers. And many of them have anywhere from 80% to 90% of their families choosing in-person instruction. That's a lot easier to deal with than having to create high quality options for a community that remains divided on their learning options. There are two main reasons we've been able to re reopen despite this 50-50 split, which then kind of landed in a 40-60 split with 40% of our families choosing in person with 60% staying back. Number one, it's an incredibly innovative, skilled, and dedicated teacher workforce. Without the incredible NBUSD teacher workforce, this district would not be open today, being able to deliver to both of those parent groups, well, the students and you know, the desires of those parent groups. Number two, our reason for being able to, to accomplish this monumental task is our Measure H technology plan and the investments approved by this school board have accelerated this district from having a mediocre technology landscape to a 21st century state-of-the-art gold standard technology landscape. While many districts negotiated with their union's distance learning scenarios last summer, the NVUSD team and NVEA had the foresight and thankfully the professional partnership that positioned us not just to spend the late summer and fall settling into distance learning, but rather working hard, working every day, spending these months preparing for in-person hybrid instruction, which involved the partnership with the unions, but also heavy lifting across all divisions, the instructional services division, the operational services division, business services, and human resources. Essentially, NVUSD established a plan, we, ex we, we prepared for that plan, and we executed on that plan. Many districts in Northern California are just starting that work now with a hope of potentially reopening campuses possibly in January. And many of them are choosing a very phased approach, grade level by grade level. So I just wanna reiterate as the superintendent tonight, how proud I am of our entire organization for getting us to this point. So let me tell you a little bit about how phase two is going as we approach completing week three. It's going really well. It's not perfect, but given the circumstances, it's going really well. Our staff and students have done an extraordinary job. First, adhering to all of the health and safety protocols. We practically have no incidents of non-compliance. Our kids are doing a great job of following these new rules. Right, Carla? Oh, yeah. Following these new rules at school because the kids who've chosen to come back to school want to be at school. In many ways, kids having to be out of school for so many months can be categorized, in my opinion, as a social injustice. It, but it was a necessary one, as this pandemic hit this country like a speed train. But now, knowing what we know, I do believe that it's important for adults in the system to figure out how our kids can come to school in safe conditions to address their socio-emotional well-being and improved academic progress. I will continue to be a champion at the local and state level for reopening schools safely, and I mean safely, for our kids in California. So I want to thank Carla and all of her K-12 peers who did come back for in-person for doing an amazing job of following the rules so that you can stay in school in person and we can keep our campuses open. I want to recognize the work of our principals and assistant principals who've become experts in running schools during a pandemic through their relentless commitment to prioritizing health and safety first in their school operations. None of them signed up to do this. I've spoken to teachers, parents, and kids who qualitatively reported that they feel safe on school campuses 
because of the operational work our 28 principals in this district are leading alongside many of their assistant principals. I always say NVUSD principals are the best in the business. All of our teachers are also doing extraordinary work. They've had so many new conditions for teaching and learning thrown their way. They continue to rise to every occasion. Primary teachers in grades TK through three continue to tend to multiple subjects for in-person groups and distance learning student groups. Teachers in grades four through 12 continue to persist through the challenges of hybrid learning and simultaneous teaching. I am so impressed and proud of our NVUSD teachers. They too are the best in the business. We cannot forget the work of our support staff. They too have had their roles and responsibilities change as we shifted into phase two. And the reason we are meeting the needs of special education students, the reason we're meeting the needs of English learners, our bilingual parent communities, and the reason we're keeping our schools clean and sanitized, the list could go on and on because support staff do so much to support our schools, is because of their same level commitment, their commitment as support staff in both the NAPS bargaining unit and CSCA, so I wanna thank them as well. And lastly, I think it's important for me to report out on our COVID-19 infection rates as another success indicator. First of all, I wanna recognize our student services director, Mike Mansway, and the team of NVUSD nurses who manage our COVID-19 response strategy on the student population side. And to our human resources team led by Ms. Dana Page, which now includes a new assistant director of COVID-19 response, Ms. Gina DeLuca, who manages COVID-19 response on the employee side. Again, we've opened for in-person instruction for almost three weeks. We've had five employee cases, four of them support staff and one infected teacher. We've had 10 student cases. Based on all of the contact tracing, all cases have been contracted outside of the school environment and all notification and quarantine procedures are being followed. I wanna quote Ms. Gina DeLuca who provided me a report on the employee infections our, and, student, and uh, the employee infections. Our NVUSD fortress is strong our amazing high walls and defense moat, face masks, hand sanitizer, space desks, plexiglass, open windows and airflow, and colored dots all over the walkways is so far keeping COVID out of our schools, given that we have over 2,000 employees and approximately 7,000 students in person on our campuses. We are aware of about 16 other NVUSD students who've been infected but they are students who are not in school in person or, and are instead enrolled in the distance learning program. As we continue to operate our campuses for hybrid instruction, me and the communications team are working on an internal and external COVID-19 tracking dashboard where we will report out on our COVID-19 infection rates within two week cycles to keep both our staff and families informed with transparent information. So please stay tuned and be patient for communication about this new strategy that we will adopt in the very near future. So if phase two is going so well, why not move to phase three right away? We're engaging in this ongoing assessment daily and weekly. In this environment, we have three priorities, health and safety, socio-emotional well-being of our students and academic progress. In a pandemic, there's often a tension between these three priorities. And as your leadership team, it is our job to manage that tension and we're trying to do that to the best of our ability so we really appreciate your patience right now despite nvusd's success with keeping covid 19 out of our schools relatively speaking given the number of students and employees on campus napa county as a whole is regressing with infection rates dr relucio talked about it at the event that trustee water mentioned we are returning to the red tier, and if current trends continue, we're likely to find ourselves back in the purple tier. Thankfully, because we opened our schools on October 26, according to the current guidelines set by Governor Newsom that are always subject to change, we can keep our schools open despite this negative spiral, unless our schools hit a 5% threshold of infection rates, or we're put in a position where 25% of our schools, seven of the 28, are closed within a 14-day period. So far, nothing like that has occurred in these first three weeks, as you could see by the data that I presented, 
and we hope that this remains our reality. But clearly, this will require NVUSD families, staff, and the community at large to not only adhere to safety protocols at work or at school, but also outside of the school setting. If we want our schools to stay open and we want our kids to experience the phase three schedule with more days on campus, we need to do a better job with COVID-19 health and safety protocols in our community at large. The schools can become a reflection of the broader community. In the school setting, we have the unique ability, thankfully, to implement low density models whereby no more than 25% of our student population is on a campus at any given time in the schedule that we have elegantly designed. And we can guarantee adherence to these protocols. Unlike the restaurant and hotel businesses, educational settings can mandate strict compliance. Our employees and families engage in daily symptom checking and are staying away when they demonstrate symptoms in order to play it safe. We can send people home who do not comply and we can enact response protocols immediately so with all of this compliance and adherence, the schools have proven to not be super spreader environments. However, like I said, we can quickly be vulnerable to what is happening outside of school. So I ask with the Thanksgiving holidays and winter break literally right around the corner, we ask that staff, students, families, and the community members at large remain mindful that your behaviors impact our students' educational opportunities during this pandemic. NVUSD will remain a, trail a trailblazer in operating schools safely in a pandemic environment, but it does really take a village always. My team and I will continue to assess these new circumstances. We will continue to use every day while in phase two to shift and prepare for phase three with increased days on campus. When the moment comes, we will be ready, just like we were ready for the pivot from phase one to phase two but we, we must continue to move with caution and responsibility and in partnership with Napa County Public Health in order to continue to manage the tensions between health and safety, socio-emotional well-being, and academic progress for our students. Our goal will be to communicate our plan for, for the phase three shift target date after the Thanksgiving break, so hang tight, as we monitor these uh, quickly changing health conditions and work with our school site staff for final preparations for the transition and gather some of the data from students as Carla Magana, our student trustee had described. She's gonna help, lead us, help us lead that work. Look, I am very aware of how excited many of our in-person families are about returning back to campus for the increased number of days. Thank you for your messages and your emails. Guess what? I'm also very excited too about getting our students back on campus for more days because I funda fundamentally also believe that it will serve many of them well. I want to remind everyone that I'm also a mom doing this work, living the same reality with my own 14 year old son and 19 year old daughter who are both still doing all distance learning because their school campuses slash educational institutions have not reopened for in person instruction yet. So I get it. I feel the urgency, the same impatience, and the desperate need to get our kids a greater sense of normalcy for both their socio-emotional well-being and academic progress, while also supporting the families who remain committed to distance learning. It's really complex. So far, NVUSD has established a great deal employing our approach. So I ask again for your patience, your partnership, and your trust as we assess and make decisions calculated decisions during these very challenging times. So please stay tuned for ongoing frequent communication about next steps in our timeline. And lastly, this is our last board meeting before Thanksgiving. So I wanna close with a huge thank you and a huge sense of gratitude. I'm so grateful for our community's commitment to our students. And I'm incredibly grateful to be serving as the superintendent of schools and NBUSD at this moment in time under these extraordinary circumstances. Please enjoy time with your family during the week long, during the week long break, all while keeping health and safety top of mind. Again, we look forward to communi communicating about our phase three transition plan shortly after our return from the holiday week. So thank you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to my assistant superintendents who also are the best in the business. And I'm gonna thank them in advance for their comprehensive reports that I know they'll provide you tonight across all the work that's happening in the divisions in preparation for upcoming transitions. But most importantly, I wanna thank them for their hard work and leadership. Without them, we would not have gotten to phase two. 
They've done extraordinary work in their respective areas as we continue to operate our school systems in a pandemic, all while still paying attention to the progress that we're making on those six strategic plan goals. So I wanna thank them publicly tonight for, for all that they've done on behalf of the students of NVUSD. And so with that, we'll start with Mr. Rob Manguala, who's our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services. Thank you, Dr. Mazzetti. Good, e good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to update the board and the community. My board report will focus on the economy, specifically inequities in the labor market. The California labor market collapsed in late March and early April due to the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent lockdown. In response to COVID-19, state and local officials took steps to limit the spread of the disease. The governor issued a statewide state home order on March 19th. Since that time, public health officials have, have issued various directives limiting daily activities. These efforts, as well as health concerns, depress economic activity across the state. As a result, many employers laid off employees, creating a dramatic increase in the unemployment rate. For example, the California economy lost 2.5 million jobs in just two months. However, the California economy has rebounded from the low which occurred within a couple months of the lockdown. Now, instead of losing 2.5 million jobs, job loss has been reduced to only 1.6 million jobs. To put this in perspective, this is where we were during the, the depth of the Great Recession. From an un unemployment perspective, we still have a long way to go. When you imagine the impact of COVID-19 job loss based on gender, education, race, and ethnicity, the inequities of the California economy were made much, much worse. For example, while women represent 45% of the workforce, women have experienced 53% of job loss. When disaggregated based on education, the same inequities are prevalent. Workers without a bachelor's degree represent 60% of the workforce. However, they represent 97% of the job loss. On, on the other hand, workers that have a bachelor's degree or master's degree or greater only represent 40% of the workforce, but have experienced only 3% of, of job loss. In terms of ethnicity, white workers represent 39% of the workforce and represent 28% of the job loss. Latino workers represent 38% of the workforce, but have experienced 50% of the job loss. Absent a, a very large federal relief package for the state of California, the COVID-19 recession will continue to disproportionately impact California's workforce. This concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Manguala. Uh, Ms. Dana Page, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Thank you. Good evening, President Martin, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Massetti. First of all, it's nice to see you all back in the boardroom. Um, HR continues to be busy building and managing new ways of doing things that used to be very routine. For instance, every year we provide a free and easy way for employees to renew their TB or tuberculosis clearance, which is a condition of continued employment with the school district. This year, due to the pandemic, we will be offering drive-through TB assessments on December 2nd and 9th. So any employee whose TB clearance is expiring this year can sign up to conduct their screening with a physician from the safety and comfort of their car. On another testing note, employee COVID surveillance testing is going well. We have Group E scheduled for next week, and we are piloting a new option through a company called Curative that allows us to bring testing kits to sites. Next week, we'll be trying this out at River Middle School, but all employees who are testing in this group can try it out at River, or they still have the option of utilizing testing at the fairgrounds, Kaiser, or another provider. It's also a different type of test that collects the sample orally through saliva rather than the nasal swab, which is a nice alternative to the nose probe method. And finally, uh, I'd like to underscore something uh, Dr. Massetti said, as people plan their Thanksgiving celebrations, we are sending out a communication to staff to share alternatives to large gatherings and tips to navigate traditional holiday events and activities such as parties, dinners, traveling, shopping, etc. in ways that keep exposure to COVID to a minimum. Of course, we want people to enjoy their holiday and celebrate the season, but we want you to be safe and healthy. So with that, uh, that concludes my report and happy Thanksgiving everyone.
Thank you, Ms. Page. If we can have Assistant Superintendent Ms. Pat Andrew Jennings of Instructional Services. Um, good evening, President Martin, trustees, student representative Magania, and Dr. Massetti. I want to echo Dr. Massetti's appreciation for our site leaders, teachers, and staff. Our successful implementation of in-person learning is due to their hard work and was not possible without their commitment and efforts. We are also uh, toward the end of the fall semester and progress reports have been sent home in the at high school and for um, middle school, the trimester closes tomorrow. As part of our ongoing effort to track student performance, we reviewed D and F rates in comparison to this time last year. There has been a significant increase in not only the number of students, but also the number of Ds and Fs students were on track to earn. Our site leaders and teachers have worked hard over the last few weeks to engage students who are struggling by providing support and encouragement, as well as opportunities for students to show their learning for the semester. For many of our students, the pandemic has created multiple barriers to their success. Each site has been working to ensure that the barriers within our control are addressed. You will see on the agenda tonight, a contract for Crescendo Education Group for professional learning for our secondary teachers on effective assessment and grading practices. The most exciting part of this work is the creation of a teacher action research cohort that will provide teachers the opportunity to explore their own assessment and grading practices over several inquiry cycles with the assistance of a research co coach. This research opportunity provides valuable learning for, for the teachers who opt in and assist in further elevating the teaching profession through classroom-based research. And lastly, on Monday, we hosted our second author talk with Filipina author May Respicio. She enthusiastically shared about her journey to become a writer and the process she uses to create the stories in her books. It was the highlight of my week um, to co-host this event with a very delightful uh, principal, Marilyn Avalon from Donaldson Way. Our next author night is scheduled for Tuesday, December 8th with author and illustrator, Juana martinez Neal who has contributed to books such as Alma and How She Got Her Name and Fry Bread. We continue to track how many books are utilized in our online library platform, Sora. Since the start of virtual learning, over 19,000 books have been checked out by our students. As part of our ongoing effort to increase literacy among our students, we continue to encourage students to pick up a book, either online or hard copy. Thank you, that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Ms. Andrew Jennings. And uh, last but definitely not least, Mr. Mike Pearson, our Assistant Superintendent of Operational Services. Thank you, Dr. Musetti. Good evening, President Martin, MBSD Board of Education trustees and members of the MBSD community. I appreciate the opportunity to provide each of you an update with the operational services and MBSD. And as I do with most of my reports, my focus will be on MBSD strategic plan goal number four, which is tactical, proactive, and efficient asset management. I'll start with the transportation department. I want to recognize uh, Director Terry Guzman, who's uh, the Director of Transportation for Napa Valley Unified. Uh, Mr. Guzman recently earned his CASBO Director of Transportation Certificate certification on October 31st. Mr. Guzman participated in a 10-month long Transportation Leadership Academy through CASBO. This intensive program provided a variety of networking tools and educated participants in attaining a more in-depth knowledge on several topics related to school transportation. Mr. Guzman has already been able to apply what he's learned to enhance transportation services to the school district that the school district provides. An excellent example is a collaboration with the MBSD Food Services Department to provide home delivered meals to students who receive special education ser services and or qualify for the free and reduced lunch program, along with their siblings. In addition, Mr. Guzman has been instrumental in ensuring students who again receive special education services, preschool students and students in outlying areas receive transportation services to NVSD for in-person instruction. Congratulations, Mr. Guzman, on your recent accomplishments and leadership as part of the NVSD team. Maintenance and grounds, Director of Maintenance and Grounds, uh, Mr. Albert D'Souza continues to provide stellar leadership. Under his oversight, staff has recently completed, completed the FIT assessment of all 28 school sites. Work orders have been created to address any areas noted in the assessment that will be completed in the next three weeks. Additionally, in the Maintenance and Grounds Department, uh, recently completed approximately 150 work orders, uh, which is pretty phenomenal um, given everything else that's going on. Finally, the department will continue to deploy portable air filters in classrooms where in-person instruction is happening. Coming Mr. to school- Pearson, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you speak just a little bit louder? <laughs> oh, I certainly can. I'm sorry, I Thank thought I was. <laughs> uh, hang on a second, I think this will help. 
in addition, finally, the department will continue to deploy portable air purifiers in classrooms where in-person instruction is happening. Coming soon to school sites will be outdoor uh, barrels with mounted hand sanitizer stations. And operations and custodial, Gloria uh, Aguirre, Director of Operations, has done an excellent job of coordinating the activities of over 100 custodial staff to make sure rooms, offices, and buildings are thoroughly cleaned and disinfected on a nightly basis. Through weekly leadership meetings with head custodians and regular school site visits to meet, other, meet with other staff, Ms. Aguirre has modeled to the operational staff the importance of daily thorough cleaning and sanitizing during the pandemic. In addition, Ms. Aguirre has ensured school sites have all the necessary PPE supplies. In food service, I need to acknowledge the entire food service team. Um, the food service staff has been doing an exemplary job making sure MVSD students, siblings, and families receive nutritional meals seven days a week by offering a combination of in-person meals, curbside pickup meals, and home delivery meals. On the surface, these uh, different options might seem fairly simplistic. But the creation, assembly, and delivery of all three uh, delivery models each week is actually quite complex and labor intensive. However, through hard work and an amazing dedication, the MVSD food service team has averaged on a daily basis during the month of October, providing over 1,500 breakfasts and 1,800 lunches daily, or about 1,100 breakfasts uh, and over 1,300 uh, lunches each week. Uh, excuse me, 13,000 lunches each week and, and 11,000 breakfasts each week. Additionally, I need to recognize the commitment of the food service and transportation teams who worked on Veterans Day to make sure families who received weekly home deliveries did on Wednesday, even though yesterday was a holiday. Lastly, the first food service team is looking forward to providing MBSC families with a Thanksgiving uh, week meal kit on Thursday, November 9th, 19th, that will also include a Thanksgiving Day meal along with seven days worth of breakfasts and lunches for the week uh, that school will not be in session. And finally, I'd like to update the MBSC Board of Trustees on high school athletics. For the past several weeks, student athletes have been participating in conditioning under the guidance of MVSD's coaching staff. Student athletes have been divided up into pods and cohorts to participate in drills that improve cardiovascular, agility, and muscular endurance. I'm pleased to announce that MVSD, along with the other high schools in the Valley and with the support of the Napa County Public Health, will begin introducing use of equipment for student athletes in their respective sport and pod slash cohorts. This is an important step in developing the skill development of our student athletes for the upcoming season, so each student athlete's athlete is able to compete at his or her highest level. I want to recognize Dr. Musetti, Marianne Christofferson, and Athletic Directors Jill Stewart, Darcy Ward, and Cam Neal for their combined advocacy efforts to incorporate the use of the equipment into daily conditioning. Over the next couple of days, the ADs will review with coaches the necessary safeguards required to allow the use of equipment in the conditioning pause and cohorts. Additionally, there's also an item under consent to recommend the Board of Education approve a contract with the, N with the NFHS network to live stream high school athletic contests for the upcoming athletic seasons. This concludes my report tonight. Thank you. Ms. Anuza, that finalizes our report. Yeah, Mr. P. Um, do you have facilities and bond update? I do. I was just waiting to be prompted for that. So now I'd like to introduce Kelly Jurgensen, who's the Vice President of Van Pelt Construction Services and uh, MVSD Measure H Program Manager to provide a brief facilities update. And I think Mr. Reich, uh, Ms. Uh, Jurgensen has a presentation. There we go. So Ms. Jurgensen. Sorry about that. I'm muting. Thank you, President Martin, trustees, and Dr. Massetti for having me back and a brief update on what we've been up to at School Planning and Construction. As always, our update is brought to you by goal number four, and today we will be talking briefly about the status of the new student commons building at American Canyon Middle School, as well as what we're planning for campus modernizations next summer. I know it seems like we're getting ready for the holidays, uh, but summer planning is always well underway this time of year. So we've made a lot of progress with the selected design build team of Arntz Builders and PBK Architects, along with school planning and construction staff and maintenance and operations staff to start to develop the design of the new student commons. Here is a collection of images that are part of completing our schematic design phase. And now we're into developing some of the details of our design. So you can see we've been working on laying out the kitchen um, as well well as talking about things like the type of operable door systems we're going to be using and starting to do some 3D modeling and flesh out what it's going to look like from the outside and talking with landscape about how the quad is going to be laid out and how things are going to work. 
Um, in preparing for spring, we have started having conversations with the contractor about how he's going to lay out his work. And so we can start planning for temporary housing. Um, we're going to be starting some conversations with the campus very soon on move planning and preparing for construction already. It seems like it's happening pretty fast, but that's because it is. Um, communication, we will be um, continuing our work with the folks at PE at American Canyon Middle School because a good portion of that new quad area is going to be used for physical education activities. Um, we are also going to um, do an update for site administration and staff, um, as well as doing a community update for parents so they can start to understand what's going to be coming soon to their campus. Um, what it's going to look like under construction and what the beautiful finished product will be. Um, so we are doing weekly meetings with the project team and this week we were also on site laying things out and doing some investigative work with the maintenance team. So things are well underway at American Canyon Middle. Uh, next, we are in the works for planning for the next phase of campus modernization projects. Uh, you probably recall the photos on the left, um, which is some of the work we did at Northwood and Bel Air. Very similar wor work will be happening at Alta Heights and Donaldson Way. Um, additionally, we'll be finishing up work at NVLA. This past summer, we did some roofing projects, but we did not do um, roofs that had HVAC systems on them, and we did not do the painting. So we'll be completing that work, and we will start the first phase of Silverado, which will be to do work on the older of the two gymnasiums because it's one of the most problematic as far as roofing is concerned. So we're well underway getting those things going and getting into DSA so we can be ready in the spring. And that concludes my report, unless there's any questions. Any questions? Questions? Thank you very much, Kelly. There are no questions. Okay, well, we are moving to I, approval of consent agenda. Background information on these items is provided to the board prior to the meeting. A common motion takes action without discussion on a roll call vote unless discussion of items is requested by the board members. I'll move to approve. First Second. by Mr. David Gracia. Second. Second by Mr. Joe Shunk. Roll call, please. Yes. Martinez? Martinez? Trustee Gonzalez Mare? Trustee Gonzalez Mare? Aye. Trustee Jenkowitz? But I would can't hear you, sorry. Can you hear me now? You can't hear me yes. Now. Barely. You can barely hear me? Can you speak louder, please? Yes. Can you hear me now? No. <laughs> it starts fine and then it goes out. Let's try it one more time, Vera. Okay. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez Mare? Aye. Trustee Jenkowitz? Aye. Trustee Water? Aye. Trustee Hurtado? Trustee Sean? Aye. Trustee Gracia? Aye. Trustee Board Member Maria? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Okay, J, presentation and discussion items. J1, General Services. J1A, California School Board Association 2020 Golden Quill Award. President Isela Martin and Dr. Massetti will present Howard Yoon with the California School Boards Association 2020 Golden Quill Award recognizing the essential role journal, journalists play in increasing understanding of the objectives, operations, accomplishments, challenges, and opportunities related to public schools. The Golden Quill Awards are given in recognition of fair, insightful, and accurate reporting on public school news by individual print, broadcast, and online news media representatives. The MVUSD Board of Education We'll congratulate Howard Yoon for the statewide recognition. Thank you. 
sure. You're good. Thank you, Howard. That's great. So um, welcome, Howard. Tonight, Howard Yun is being presented a Certificate of Excellence in Reporting by the Napa Valley Unified School District. The California School Boards Association will also, just so everyone knows, issue a press release and publish winners on its website of the special recognition at www.csba.org and in the spring edition of California School Magazine published by the organization. As part of the CSBA Golden Bell Awards program, school district and county boards of education can nominate journalists like Howard for the Golden Quill Award as described by President Martin, highlighting work that was reported in an accurate and insightful manner and identifying stories where the nominee demonstrated a holistic understanding of the local education, educational agency and all of its stakeholders. Nominees must have also developed relationships with the school board and relevant district and site level staff, in addition to understanding the district or county office of education's missions, goals, and or strategic vision during the reporting process. It was our pleasure to nominate our own Howard Yoon from the Napa Valley Register. Reporting that is fair and insightful is the hallmark of any good journalist, and those take the time to also share the perspective of their local district staff and school board members are integral in providing a window for the community into the breadth of issues facing public education today. The Golden Quill Awards recognizes the best of these journalists in the state of California, and CSBA is very proud to shine a light on their reporting, according to the CSBA president, Silonin Cruz Gonzalez. Howard, since I arrived in the Napa Valley Unified School District in July of 2018, I've been so impressed by your ability to report on NBUSD related issues, and there's been many. With fairness, accuracy, and a strong commitment and statement of the facts, all while presenting varying perspectives and positions on very complex issues. That's really hard to do. You've covered so many complex topics impacting the educational lives of NVUSD students and graduates. Thank you for your hard work, your commitment to reporting on the, success and the successes and challenges that we face, and for building a relationship built upon integrity and professionalism with our organization. We all enjoy working with you, even when addressing the tough topics in the media. I want to personally congratulate you as a recipient of this distinguished recognition from this important organization. It's very important. The California School Boards Association is very important to school boards and school districts. They serve as a key leader in the work impacting California K-12 public school systems. So if you have an interest in learning more about this Golden Quill Award that we give, that we're giving tonight and presenting to Mr. Howard Yan, please vi visit CSBA's award webpage. So congratulations, Howard. And now I'd like to invite any of the trustees to congratulate you as well. But first, I just want to hand you your award. So here it is, everyone, the Golden Quill Award. Here you go, Howard. We'll let you speak in a moment, Howard, but I think there might be trustees who'd also like to shower you with praise and congratulations. I, I have a, a brief comment. Well, you know, my definition of brief is different than everyone else's. <clears throat> uh, there has been a great deal of dialogue regarding the media and the importance of trust in American journalism. We are so fortunate to have a small town paper and an education writer who thoughtfully and intelligently addresses the challenges and the successes of NBUSD. Local reporting has the advantage of serving communities with information that is relevant to our everyday lives. And this has never been more important as it, than it is today. Howard has addressed state level issues, complex policies and challenges, and defined them within the context of our organization. Without local media, communities turn to other outlets for their stories, and we have the privilege of being covered by someone who is dedicated to authenticity and understands the value of quality content. Chuck Plunkett hosted a TED Talk in June of 2019 about the importance of local news. And the tagline was, when local news dies, 
so does democracy. I'm not trying to dramatize the decline of local newsrooms, but rather refocus our appreciation for what we have. This is my favorite excerpt, sorry, Cindy, I know how you feel about excerpts, from the talk. <laughs> a democracy is a government of the people, and people are the ultimate source of power and authority. A great local newsroom acts like a mirror. Its journalists see the community and reflect it back. That information is empowering. Seeing, knowing, understanding. That is how good decisions are made. So thank you, Howard. Howard has won several California Journalism Awards, as well as California Newspaper Publisher Association Awards, and I'm sure there are many others. But we are proud to add CSBA's Golden Quill Award for Excellent Educational Reporting to his list of accomplishments and accolades. So congratulations from all of us at NDUSD. I too wanted to take a minute to thank Howard. He's a very dedicated reporter who would often be the only member of the audience at the end of our midnight or 1 a.m. meetings. His dedication covering the entirety of our meetings is commendable, but his ability to cover meetings lasting deep into the night isn't the primary reason he's receiving this award tonight. Howard is primarily being honored tonight for his writing. He has the ability to take some of the complex issues that come before the school board and translate them into prose that can be easily understood by the citizens of the Napa Valley. His coverage usually cuts right to the heart of an issue and he fairly presents both sides of that issue. He usually has some great quotes that lend perspective to the story and strives not to take a speaker out of context. He, uh, Howard is so thorough, he often rewatches portions of our meeting so he can get a quote just right. His reporting is accurate and on point, which really helps the public to understand what happens at our school board meetings. That is why tonight's award is so well deserved. Congratulations, Howard. Howard, I would like to thank you for being an important part of civics education in the city of Napa. Um, I, I know that no matter what you do, how much you write, how many awards you receive, there will be people who think that the mayor of Napa actually runs the schools or that we get extraordinary amounts of um, hotel occupancy tax. Uh, so, and <laughs> you might put that in your next story. We don't. <laughs> she isn't, she doesn't, but, um, but uh, it is important. And thank you so much for sticking it out to the end. And after one extremely contentious meeting, Howard came up to me and asked if this was the worst public meeting I had ever been involved in. And I said, no, not at all. I was on the city council in 1995 with a certain individual who will not be named. <laughs> he started laughing. He actually knew what I was talking about. So um, thank you so much for, uh, for um, all your work. You know, previous speakers, um, I agree with everything they said and, you know, approaching it with really uh, terrific good humor. I, we do appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, accurate uh, without bias. I think the applauses are more for you, Lay, not after we speak. <laughs> um, Howard, you know, I, I think just you represent um, 
more than just to our school district, but to our community. And I think that's what counts because in order to tell a story um, fully, it's really understanding the temperature and the pulse of the community at large. So I think when you, when you, when you are that, that journalist and you are that writer, you're able to, to translate the, uh, the technicalities and the emotions of a room because you know what's going out, you know what's happening outside this room. And that, that kind of story is, is pretty clear when you, when you read it. Um, and to, as a reader, right, and, and, and sharing with, with that information via social media and whatnot, it's very appreciative to be able to do that with an easiness um, and without thought really and in really helping spread the word out to the community because they they deserve to know um you know how things are going so really appreciative of that and and really congratulations we will let we will let you say a couple words if you'd like <laughs> Well, for you trustees and for anyone who is watching this broadcast, I think I will start off by saying that I am not an expert on education. <laughs> Even after several years of this, I'm still not an expert on education. What I have to offer is the willingness simply to keep my eyes and my ears open and to, to never stop being curious. I've learned probably along with many of the readers as, as I've sat in on these meetings, poured through documents, spoken with teachers, with parents, visited schools, talked to children and teenagers here. And, and in these times, and especially in the year 2020, I realize that there's a lot more at stake now covering the school district and education generally than I could have imagined even nine months ago. So all I can say is it's more of a challenge than it's ever been, and I will do my best to keep meeting that challenge. Thank you. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. J1B, Introduction to California School Board Association's Recommended Policy Updates. So, um, trustees, these are just, um, it's the work that was alluded to by Ms. Uh, um, uh, Vice President uh, Gonzalez Mares. This is the latest update from CSBA that was reviewed by policy committee. We are presenting it today just for initial uh, review and discussion and introduction, and it'll be brought forth for action um, at the next board meeting on December 10th. Any discussion? I do have a comment. Um, I understand after reading some of these policies that we're being required to implement new policies and regulations surrounding uh, sexual harassment claims that include putting such claims under a Title IX administrator. And I just wanted to caution the district that in creating these new policies that great care is taken and that we are making certain to preserve due process and make sure our system won't be considered prejudicial either to the accuser or the accused. The news is littered with colleges who have been successfully sued over these very same issues. Millions have been paid out to college students who were denied due process or were forced to participate in rigged or unfair processes. I would just like the district to make sure to get our procedures reviewed by legal counsel and pay extra attention to the setup of these systems and procedures as the liability for getting them wrong can be enormous. 
having attended the CSBA webinar a couple of months ago on this topic, I can assure you that's the advice coming out of CSBA. Any other discussions? Okay, move on to J2, business and operations. J2A, laws related to excess property presentation. Mr. Mangual, are you going to introduce this item? Or are we going right to Ms. Uh, Kelly Rem? We can go to uh, Ms. Kelly Rem. Uh, Ms. Kelly Rem. Great. Okay. And can you hear me? Okay. And can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Speak loudly, Ms. Rem. Okay, will do. Thank you. So um, I, my name is Kelly Rum. I'm an attorney with Lozano Smith and Dominic Dutra is also joining me from 3D Strategies tonight. We are both consultants that work with the district on real property matters, myself from the legal side and, and Dominic from the, um, the brokerage or consultant side. And we had the great opportunity a few weeks ago to present this um, same presentation to the facilities committee and we're asked to come back and, and repeat it here tonight. I know you have a long agenda, so I'll try to be brief and I'm happy to take questions. I'll also um, turn it over to Dominic on, on some of these topics as well. But basically what we're asked to do tonight is just to give kind of an overview of the process that applies to school district disposition of real property. Um, and so you can see there on the first slide, it talks about a multi-step process and it, it is indeed. And one thing I just wanna kind of set the stage with here is that keep in mind that while there are specific statutory steps, there are also a lot of different alternatives, special rules and exemptions that apply. Um, so we're gonna go over those steps and I'll kind of try to mention where some of those nuances are as well. Um, one thing that sometimes can get missed is that these rules apply not only to the sale of property, but also lease of property. There are some distinct, some differences between the two, but, but that is something that people don't always realize they apply to leasing as well. Um, as far as the process, it is generally found in the government code and the education code. And so this slide kind of gives a general list of the steps um, that apply when you're disposing, when school districts are disposing of real property. And this is the roadmap that I'm going to follow in the following slides. Um, one thing you'll note, item two on this list is kind of more of a practical reality than a legal requirement. Um, it, it, we added that in because a lot of times the reality is that kind of prior to going through all of the legal steps, school districts will, as they are absolutely permitted to do, consider options and kind of make a game plan before they jump right into the process. And I'll let Dominic in a minute talk about his interest-based negotiations, what he means by that. But how I see it is that you do have some exceptions to these rules and these processes. Um, for example, we, we work with a lot of districts that may have property that's suitable for certain uses like park uses or use by another local agency, there are some alternative rules that can apply. And so sometimes you might get into a situation where you have a win-win and it's a, a good time to, to forge those partnerships with, with other local agencies. So that's kind of what we mean by that. The other seven steps here are really the, the meat of the legal process. And we can flip, flip to the next slide. And I'll let Dominic just kind of jump in on this one. If he's there, Dominic. Kelly, would you like to cover this slide? He, he might be having internet problems. Yep, no problem. So again, you know, this is this is something that um, Dominic, one of the district's consultants presented. I, I'm here, are you there? Go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I was just unmuted on the, on the other side of the equation. So you want me to jump into this real quick? Sure. Very good. Okay, so let me just walk through this. As, as Kelly has noted, um, you know, from a practical perspective, as you look through the legal requirements as, as mandated by the state, they really are uh, meant to be an encouragement for the owners of public property to talk to other entities about what might be some uh, mutually shared interests that both parties might have. And so what the state has now done is given opportunities for school districts to have these direct negotiations 
with, in this case, with cities, because obviously the, the school district properties are owned within those cities. Uh, so just to, you could obviously look at the slide and see some of the uh, points there, but just to give you two practical examples, uh, working actually with Kelly's firm in uh, San Juan Unified School District uh, uh, in the Sacramento area, uh, we went and had a property that was a former school site that actually was uh, made surplus, and then we went to the city <laughs> to engage about some potential opportunities for that property to uh, achieve its highest and best use and therefore the highest value. And when we did, the city made very clear that they had some other interests. So to make a long story short, we entered it into interest-based negotiations, walked through the series of steps that you're seeing before you here, and ultimately were successful in getting an appraisal that both parties were able to sign off on. The city ended up purchasing the site um, with some funds that they had and we were able to move forward very quickly, I know we need to move on to the other slides, but on the other side, when I served on the Fremont City Council, uh, the Fremont Unified School District uh, had four sites that they sold, and one of which was in fact uh, adjacent to a city-owned park. And so uh, the city had an interest in acquiring it, and as you'll hear, hear very soon from Kelly, there's a Naylor Act requirement um, uh, that talks about a discounting of the property and that sort of thing. The truth of the matter is that practically speaking, despite how much we as a city wanted that park, we, we had to negotiate with the school district and ended up buying it at its highest and best use, which was for residential development. So really, just to close off here, what, what this really is all about is, is having an opportunity to discuss offline with these entities how we might come to a plan that meets the mutual interests of both parties, uh, knowing that there will need to be some compromise on both sides. But um, at the end of the day, um, we've seen it to be very, very successful. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Kelly. Great, thank you, Dominic. And we can go to the next slide. So now I'm gonna jump in on the legal process. So assuming that there's not some, some alternative um, that can apply along the lines of the examples that Dominic just gave, this is what would be legally required before a sale of property or lease of property. Obviously, the first thing is to identify the properties in question, that's kind of a no brainer, and then convene a committee. Um, we commonly call it the 7-Eleven committee. It's an advisory committee made of between seven and 11 members and they have to um, meet certain criteria, certain categories of criteria. This board and community will remember that there was a 7-Eleven committee process undertaken last fall related to um, potential closure of elementary schools. And while that committee did not consider the disposition of those properties has not done that at this time, um, uh, that is the other purpose of, of, of forming the 7-Eleven committee is, is both for school closure issues as well as um, property disposition. And interestingly, the statutes actually expressly require an appointment of a specific committee to undertake certain tasks when you're talking about disposition. Those same rules don't technically apply to school closure, although it is pretty common um, that school districts will go through that process anyway. Uh, and, and that's what this district did. So the committee gets appointed by the board. We typically recommend that they be charged with a specific task. For example, if there are certain properties in question that the district might be might want to consider, might want to get information and recommendations on regarding disposition, those properties would be specified. It doesn't necessarily say that um, the committee has to consider every single property owned by the district. The other thing you'll find with the process is that once the committee is um, formed and given its charge, they are governed by the Brown Act, but there isn't really that much other guidance in the statutes about how, about the procedures. And so, for example, there's no rule about how many times they have to meet or anything like that. So there is flexibility there based on the needs of the district and the community and, and what makes sense in each context. Um, one quick thing, and I'm, I'll try as we go through this presentation to mention some changes in the law that came down in the past few months. So there is one here which applies to property that was never used as a school site. A new law that was just signed in, in September allows um, a districts to bypass the 7-Eleven committee process for those non-school sites. Next slide. 
Great. Okay, so, so the committee is convened, they meet, they review data and provided by district staff, and then they come back and make a re recommendation to the board regarding use of surplus space and real property. So that's, that's kind of the specific, as specific as the process gets. Uh, the board then reviews the recommendation and can decide whether or not to declare the property as surplus. Um, we do like to note that the committee's report is only advisory. The, obviously, the school board ultimately has the discretion to make the decision whether to close a school or to sell a property, um, but does you know, consider, that, consider that report and recommendation of the committee. Um, the one other thing I just want to mention on this slide is we talk about declaring property surplus and I think everyone kind of sees that as a logical step in the process. There's no specific rule in the education code that says the board has to take an action to declare property surplus. Having said that, there's a recent change in the government code procedures that's probably a little bit too complicated to get into in this pr presentation. Um, but it essentially, the government code sections have a whole slew of additional requirements that apply. And there's an ability to, for school districts, we believe the intent is to exempt themselves from those procedures. But all local agencies now have to declare property as either surplus land or exempt surplus land. This is as, as of January 1st in order to sell it or dispose of it. Um, and so even though the education code has never required that specific declaration, it is now a government code requirement. So just wanted to note that. Next slide. Okay, so I kind of see this as step two in the legal process. Um, so we've, we've now identified the properties and the committee has been formed and has weighed in with their recommendations on what to do with those properties um, and the property has been declared surplus. The next kind of step in the process is what we refer to as statutory or required offers. And this is where a whole bunch of different provisions come into play in both the education code and the government code that the district has to either off, offer the property to certain entities or just notify them that the property may be for sale. And so the first kind of consideration in that notification process is under the Naylor Act, which is only applicable to certain property. And that is property with playgrounds, play fields and open space that has been used that way for at least eight years. Um, technically, when the Naylor Act is triggered, it applies to the entire site, but we have certainly seen districts um, kind of divide the site into different areas and surplus them separately. So, for example, if you have a site that has play fields as well as buildings, um, you know, we've, we've had situations where the play field area is going to be surplus separately. It will be offered pursuant to the Naylor Act requirements but the buildings will either be retained by the district or um, you know, separately surplused and, and go through the process without um, reference to the Naylor Act because it would not be applicable. And so when the Naylor Act applies, it's these entities um, will get first priority to purchase the property. And generally speaking, they are park and recreation districts as well as the city and county where the, where the property is located. And note that if these entities want to acquire the property, they have to use it for park and recreation purposes. So if they, if they were to acquire it pursuant to the Naylor Act, they can't just then turn around and develop it in some way. If they were to do that, the district would have a right to, to get the property back. A um, couple other things. So one other major point with the Naylor Act is that the district provides notice to the, the required entities. They have 60 days to respond. And then if they are interested, there is a formula pursuant to which the purchase price is determined. And that is, generally speaking, it's the cost of acquisition of the property adjusted by inflation plus the cost of improvements adjusted by inflation. In re reality, um, when the Naylor Act applies, it can be difficult to, to figure out exactly what that number is. Um, and so in my experience, we almost always see some sort of a negotiation take place. And that kind of gets back to what Dominic alluded to earlier. So, so that's, that's essentially the, the Naylor Act in a nutshell. There are a couple of other nuances. Um, districts can apply for a waiver of the Naylor Act provisions only uh, no more than 30% of total surplus space can be purchased or leased through the Naylor Act. 
Um, and again, I, like, as I said, if it is purchased, then it must be used for playground, play field, or other outdoor recreational spaces, or else it has to get offered back to the district. That's our Naylor Act slide. And moving on to the next slide, some additional offers that are required. I'm not going to go into great detail on these. There are quite a few different provisions, but generally speaking, this next group of notices or offers go out to a whole bunch of different entities and they have 90 days, or excuse me, they have 60 days to respond. And then the district has 90 days to negotiate in good faith. So the difference here is that there's no requirement to sell if you can't reach a deal. Um, there's no requirement that the property be sold pursuant to a, a particular formula. There's just a good faith negotiation requirement. And actually the cities and counties have another bite at the apple under this process, um, as well as in any case where the Naylor Act does not apply. Um, one quick thing to note about a recent change in the law, again, this just came down in September. Um, we had always taken the position that all of these offers could go out at the same time, but that, you know, the priorities had to follow whoever got first priority. Um, that has now been confirmed into law per Senate Bill 820. So you can send the Naylor Act offers plus these tier one and two offers all out at the same time. Um, you just have to make sure that, you know, whatever responses are received or interest in that property, the proper priorities are put in place. And then one other public notice that goes out before selling property, and this actually uh, applies to acquisition as well, is notifying the Planning Commission. They have 40 days to respond um, with a finding as to whether or not the proposed disposition is conform in conformance with the general plan. Um, but even if they come back and say that it is not, the, the um, school board has the right to override that finding or to move forward with notwithstanding it. Okay. So that concludes the notice provisions or the statutory offers, which I said was the kind of second step in the legal process after the committee weighs in. Um, once that's all done and if the property remains unsold or unleased, we get to the public bidding process, the competitive bidding process. Um, that may confuse a lot of people because the vast majority of school districts, particularly with larger properties, will seek waivers from the state. I'll talk about that in a minute when we get to exceptions. Um, but if there's a waiver from the state, then you're not going through a strict competitive bid process. Instead, you're marketing the property um, and negotiating a sale. That, that is much more common currently. So don't be confused when I say competitive bidding is required. But first step is that uh, the board adopts a resolution of its intent to sell or lease the, the property. That's a super majority two thirds vote. And then there's public notice provided of that resolution. The resolution will basically say that the, the board intends to sell this property and is putting it out to bid. Um, and the next slide, at the, the resolution of intent will set a board meeting at which competitive bids will be opened and the property may be sold to the highest bidder. Um, and then within three weeks from adoption, or at least three weeks from adoption of the resolution, at an open meeting, the board opens the bids, examines and declares them, um, makes a call for oral bids, accept the highest, accepts the highest responsible bid or rejects all bids. So if, if none of them are good enough, the board does not have to sell. Um, and then within 10 days, the decision is made. So it can either be made that night or, or within 10 days. So that's what the statutory process is. It's a, it's a competitive bid process, just like you have with your construction processes process, except for the fact that you're going with the high bid instead of the low bid. Um, moving on to the next slide. If you look at the second to last bullet there, state waivers, that's a very, very commonly invoked exception to the competitive bid process which basically involves submitting a waiver to the state, um, state Board of Education and asking them to allow the district to move forward with a competitive process um, where price is certainly going to be considered, but you can negotiate, you can market the property, you can take proposals and look at terms besides just the price. And there's countless benefit to doing so. And that's why we see that very commonly done with the vast majority of our clients. Um, some other quick exceptions just to be aware of. There's, there's one that applies to childcare and development services. So for example, if you were going to sell 
property or lease property to one of those types of organizations. There's an exception that can apply. Um, Dominic and I are actually doing a deal with another district in, on that as well. Well, right now, as long as they provide child care services for at least five years, um, there's an exception for 30 day leases, 30 days or less for a property involving a residence or historical building for land exchanges. This is an interesting one that we see invoked quite a bit. Sometimes you can do some really interesting things with exchanging property. Most often I see that done with other local agencies. Um, but in any case, doing so is exempt from the majority of the process I just described. There are special rules that might apply in the, in the context of workforce or employee housing, so be aware of that as well. I covered state waivers. And then the very last thing we have there is what we call the no harm, no foul or safe harbor provision. And that's a provision in the education code that essentially says you sell your property or lease your property without going through these, these procedures. Nobody can sue to undo the sale or undo the conveyance of property. Now, obviously, as an attorney, we don't advocate for not following the law. And so, of course, the, all the steps should be followed. But where we see this come into play a lot of times is that there are some ambiguities in the law. There are some gray areas where we don't have any guidance. And so sometimes it makes sense to go one way or the other. And we say, you know, we kind of rely on this as a fallback if someday someone is challenged because they, they picked the wrong, the wrong area in the gray area. So again, not, not something to rely on in order to violate the law, but certainly a good fail safe if there's um, something that's not completely clear in the process. Just got, got a couple quick slides left if you want to switch it to the next one. So this is legislative updates. I already alluded to most of these. Um, oh, the first one we haven't talked about, but just be aware to the extent you're not already that um, there are limitations on how you can spend the money from sale of property, but per SB 50 and follow-up legislation as well, um, there has been a flexibility added to, to the law to um, for those expenditures. And so that is a direct result or a direct um, response to the pandemic and the fact that, you know, budget has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so what the legislature did is revive legislation from 2008, which allowed flexibility of spending money. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but just be aware that there are limit, you know, there, there are rules that you have to follow. It's, it's not just an absolute that right now you can sell property and use the money however you want. Um, it still has to be for one-time general fund purposes, and there are certain requirements you have to meet before you can spend it in, a, in an alternative way. Normally, those expenditures are limited to um, capital outlay type of expenses and, and um, non-deferred maintenance. And then we talked about the, the exception to the 7-Eleven committee for non-school sites. Um, that's a new law. The other big deal was, I alluded to this earlier as well, the law that became effective on, or the change I should say, because these laws already existed, that became effective on January 1st under the government code. Um, just be aware that it, it appears the legislator intended to exempt most school district property from most of these rules, but not all of them. There is a little bit of ambiguity there, um, but at the end of the day, what the government code sections require are additional notices and offers to sell the property for housing purposes. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ramifications um, associated with that as well. So again, suffice it to say, just I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, that's a new law as of January 1st that has some, some kind of gray areas. But we do believe that school districts have the ability to exempt their, their sale of property from most of those provisions. And I think the last slide, Dominic, if you want to jump in on anything I've covered or, or just cover this and then we'll happy to take questions. Sure. And just to sum up here. So what you're effectively seeing as Kelly's walked through these various slides is that the state is more and more uh, becoming proactive in terms of trying to dictate really what happens with uh, land that is owned by local public entities. Um, you're seeing more and more of the control uh, shifting to the state for priorities that the state is establishing. So you, Kelly should walk you through a number of these where you have to make preferential offerings for, um, you know, park property, nail it or act, that sort of thing. 
Um, what you're seeing though is that there's a, a nexus starting to develop, meaning what, what is happening with these public sites is the state is now saying that because of the housing shortage, there's a severe demand for land for additional housing. So when surplus land comes up, what you're seeing with state laws that they're pushing it now toward uh, the development of additional housing. Well, cities have to develop additional housing because they have regional housing needs. So school district land becomes available. More and more of this land is being pushed for residential development. Well, it just so happens that, uh, uh, you know, with what might seem counterintuitive is with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen an incredible upsurge in terms of demand uh, and the value of housing. So putting the two together, which you're able to do very often working with cities as you work through these, as I said earlier, interspace, interspace negotiations, are opportunities to help a city meet its housing requirements by using a portion of the site uh, for, uh, for housing, which tends to be the highest and best uh, value of the site anyway from the school district's perspective, and then incorporating open space and park areas within that same development, which meets the Naylor Act requirement on an open space perspective. So a lot of times the, uh, the ability to get together, talk about these things, kind of working through all of the, the legalese, uh, and Kelly's fantastic in doing that, um, practically speaking, there's an opportunity for uh, entities like a school district to, to work with cities uh, to come up with a plan that allows them to take advantage in a uh, both advantage in a way that's mutually acceptable. So with that, as Kelly said, we're certainly available for questions. So next slide. Questions? Okay, thank you very much, Kelly Rem and Dominic Dutra. Thank you. Good night. Oh. I'm sorry, is there any public comment on this item? No public comments at this time, President Martin. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Okay, moving on to J3 Instructional Services, J3A, Instructional Support Services Division presentation and update on the health education at the high school level. Uh, good evening good again, evening again. President Martin, um, Trustees, Student Representative Magania, and Dr. Massetti. Um, tonight, I'm here to provide an update on health education in Napa Valley Unified with a focus on high school. Next slide, please. Uh, comprehensive health education is essential for our students, especially now given current, the current public health concerns with the pandemic. Up until 2010, students in Napa Valley Unified School District's high schools were required to complete one semester, uh, a one semester health class as a graduation requirement. In 2010, the district made the decision to have the health content be delivered in ninth grade physical education classes. Initially, class sizes in ninth grade physical education were reduced so classes could fit into a classroom for the health education component. Since then, there have been concerns with this delivery model and a health task force was formed in 2017 to revisit the issue. The, the health task force led by then Assistant Superintendent Marianne Vias met until December of 2019. Prior to her departure in April, she indicated that the health task force's recommendation was to revert back to a standalone health course requirement. As the new assistant superintendent, I met with the health task force in June to review the proposed recommendation in preparation for a formal presentation to the board. Next slide, please. The goals of a comprehensive health education program is to ensure that students are aware of how to stay emotionally, physically, and mentally healthy. For that to happen, health education content needs to be taught to students throughout their K-12 journey with us. In May of 2019, the California Department of Health, uh, Health I'm sorry, the California Department of Education adopted a new K-12 health framework. The components consist of six topics, nutrition and physical activity, growth, development, and for secondary students, sexual health, injury prevention and safety, 
alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, mental, emotional, and social health, and finally, personal and community health. Next slide. Since the final task force meeting in June, we have onboarded a new secondary director and focused primarily on reopening schools safely. As critically important as health education is for our students, the recommendation from staff at this time is to keep the content in ninth grade physical education for the 2021-22 school year. Simply more time is needed to successfully implement any necessary changes. Next slide, please. To increase the effectiveness of health education for our high school students, we need to consider the impact of creating a one semester course that is required for graduation and collaboratively work, collaboratively work out the issues related to curriculum, mater curriculum materials, credential requirements, and staffing. Additionally, decisions would need to be made for the partner semester course to the health course requirement as well as exploring what role early and late flight might play. The impact on elective options for ninth grade students has also been raised. More time is needed to review other possible options, such as the integration of health curriculum into other relevant content areas over the course of a student's four years. I acknowledge that some of these considerations have been reviewed and discussed over the years that the task force met. As we progress through this most unusual year, more time is needed to successfully implement any changes in health education for students in school. Next slide. And that concludes my brief update. Um, are there any questions or comments? Questions, board? I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing Trustee Jankowitz. I was just wondering, sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. I apologize. Are you, <laughs> masks, microphones. Um, are you still going to have a task force convene to kind of navigate this over the next 12 months? Is it being done just at the district level or are you still having site involvement? we will absolutely have to have site involvement. And that's part of the reason that we sort of press pause on sort of implementing anything for next school year is that we really need the time to gather all of the relevant stakeholders and really see how we can successfully implement a more robust health curriculum. Thank you. I have some comments on this item. It seems to me that the idea that we need more time after having studied this issue for three years tends to indicate that this item is likely not a good choice, right? It, would, it seems to be a non-starter. You know, I support the idea of um, health continuing to be taught in PE. Uh, I think that moving health to a separate class might prevent freshmen from uh, being able to fit in a VAPA class into their schedule, like dance band, choir, or theater. It could also impact a student's ability to take classes like AVID. It also wasn't clear what students would take in their second semester once the health class is completed. And if this were to become a class, it needs to be presented with academic rigor and not be a check a box class. I had further concern about the inequity of clever parents opting their children out of this class as there isn't an AP or honors option, which could hurt their GPA. So I think that we're making the right move here and question whether more time is really going to get us to where we need to be considering we've studied this issue for three long years now. Can I just quickly comment on, on that? And, and I agree. I think it's been studied. I think the people that are on the that have served on the task force um, are frustrated in both directions. Um, um, I do think that when you look at the components of, uh, of the topics that are covered um, in the health framework, there are some parts of it that lie very easily in PE and there are components that might need to land somewhere else. Um, but I do think it's worth like uh, involving um, some of the stakeholders at the campuses to really sort of 
figure out the best way forward. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm sympathetic uh, to the parents who um, are concerned about what their children would take the uh, second semester. And I'm sympathetic to the parents who believe that we need to have um, quality health education delivered, particularly in times such as these, when there are so many people, even people in very, very high places, um, getting utterly nonsensical ideas, you know, off the internet about, you know, things like, well, gee, we can run around and lead our lives just like we used to and COVID will magically disappear. Or the lady in, um, down in Orange County who caused the public health officer to quit um, because she doesn't, she thinks that uh, wearing masks are an infringement on her rights as an American. And I, I think maybe this is, I don't, I don't want to um, freak you out, Pat, but um, you know, this is, this is really a big issue. And I do think some of this could be handled in other classes. Um, part of it is um, in enabling people how to find accurate information. I mean, that's something that we should also be looking at. But, um, you know, good luck and I'll support, you know, anything you come up with. Um, I do, but again, I think um, good health, health education is very, very important for, for our students. Thank you, but thanks for all your work. You're welcome, Trustee Waters. There, there's one comment. I did sit on the task force for a brief period of time. Um, and there were some really, I mean, David, to, to your point, I will say there were some really innovative ideas and some of those ideas combined health and, you know, sex education with, um, you know, career and college readiness and, you know, studying capabilities and, you know, sort of an advisory component. And I'm not advocating for one versus the other. I'm saying that there was a lot of creative discussion about the importance of health the importance of possibly navigating health classes, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th, and what that would look like. And, um, and that the standalone semester um, could be somehow formed to incorporate many other issues and take in the social, emotional, and, and then those issues kind of would mature and be applicable to each grade. So there were some, I think, very innovative ideas that, again, I'm not advocating for one I uh, one idea versus the other. But what it does say is that, I don't know that it's such a tired issue, is that it's an issue that has evolved and has gained some traction and that we want to get it right. So that's my comment. And and Trustee um, Jenkowitz, I agree. Like we want to get it right. Um, it's, I think there's some concerns around how it is structured now. And um, we want to, whatever change we make, we want to make sure that it's the right change. Um, you know, the area of health is such a priority. I think we can focus so much on the academic side of it, but the health component is, it, it, the weight on that is tremendous on our kids. And especially after, um, you know, and while we're going through COVID and even after COVID, we have no idea yet what are, are the impacts in the, of our children going through this traumatic experience and the families going through this. So I think taking, um, yes, I, you know, it's been, uh, you know, this is um, um, Pat Andrew Jennings, you know, her, her first year in this. So I want to give her the, the, in my end, the full support to look into, into further um, establishing a, you know, a permanent space for this because our kids cannot uh, wait till college or wait until you know, a, a friend who might be, you know, um, misinforming or wanted to learn about their, their health. That is just something that we cannot afford as, as a community. And we are a teaching institution. It's a learning institution and re it requires that space. Um, so I, I really appreciate the comprehensive look at the social emotional aspect of it, because when we think of health, in a traditional way of, of, as I look in the room in the, in the traditional way of what, how we were taught, it was very much on the physical aspect of it. Um, but now we understand as, as, adver as, for, as adverse childhood experiences, it's more than just the physical body, but it's the mental and the community experiences that you also endure. That is so critical to the, um, to, uh, 
building a strong foundation for our students to have um, to, to to really enjoy right and be able to take in all the the quality programs that we have in education so um, it is it is so important and um, and I know we discussed this at the curriculum meeting um, you know back in in September 23rd just to show that even at today's meeting we're still in that process of still looking into what are the next steps so yeah absolutely full force with that task force if it's if it just like we've we've shown with our math task force and everything else you know if, if they can uh, conduct that work and, and and I trust that you will follow that same process with this one uh, as in regards to health education I think we will have the outcomes that we've been been seeing so I'm I'm excited to 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 see what that would look like so thank you for all your hard work any additional comments mr. Reese are there any public comments on this item Yes, president Martin we do have a uh... A, a few uh, public comments. Uh, we'll start with Kim Whipple. Hi, I'm back. Uh, thank you for hearing me again. Uh, my background on the subject is that I'm a PE teacher at, in our district. I'm the health to I was the health TOSA for one year, and I was also part of that health committee um, from the beginning, even before 2017. But after years of being told the work's meaningful, we're getting there, okay, we're close, okay, we'll implement it next year. For my own health and well-being, I dismissed myself from the committee after the frustration and having a sincere lack of hope for quality health education to return to our students. From my experience as a PE teacher and as a TOSA, I'm educated on what is actually happening or not happening in our schools. And when it comes to health education right now, in our secondary schools, we're asking for teachers, excuse me, we're asking for PE teachers to teach that health. This is cause of great concern because it's not actually happening. I know all the PE teachers in the district and it's not happening. Um, you've all talked about the importance of the topic, but while, and we sit and we look at next steps, um, we've been doing that for years and we have more students right now that are not receiving the information um, of proper and adequate health ed education. Um, the information I'm about to share is taken from the new health information from the California Department of Education and it states, to provide the comprehensive health education that students need and parents and guardians and caretakers want, local school boards and district and site level administrators must demonstrate they value health education by allocating appropriate time and resources for effective implementation of health education. Health education that supports the development of health literacy in all students should be a priority as administrators and district level personnel develop policy plans and budgets. Administrators and response are responsible for ensuring that health education instruction is provided by appropriately credentialed teachers, in particular teachers with credentials in health and science or health education for middle and high school grade levels. Estate school boards are advised to evaluate the effectiveness of their school health program, including the extent to which education codes and other state and federal statutes are being followed. And it also states local school board members, administrators, instructional leaders, and school health professionals have the additional responsibility of periodically evaluating the effectiveness of the health education program to ensure that it is meeting the needs of a diverse student population, including LGBTQ plus students, English language learners, and students with the disabilities. I advise our district, the board of our administrators to listen to the recommendations of the CDE our health committees have dug into the real work for years for now, and we can no longer afford to be negligent and continue to sweep this valuable curriculum into PE class. Thank you for allowing me to speak my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go with the uh, next up is Manya Frank Franco. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so I am also a 21 year uh, PE teacher of our district. And um, I feel like, oh, mm -hmm. you know what? I just lost my screen when you went. Uh, is there any way that the timer? I have to display the timer for the, um, for the public speak comments. Okay, I don't know why I lost my full screen. Okay, there we go. Um, so 
I think Pat summarized a lot of what I was going to say in terms of the history of the committee. Um, although I do want to say that this committee has uh, started well beyond 2017. Um, like Kim said, I mean, I can say over the past eight years, I've been part of multiple health and PE committees. Um, we've worked year after year going in circles with the same interests and concerns with no forward progress. Um, and, and I have to tell you, one of the biggest frustrations that I saw was, you know, we had this meeting, we finalized the outcome of our work earlier this summer, as Pat mentioned in June. And um, we were prepared to move forward with a recommendation to bring health back as a standalone class, finally, after all these years. So imagine my surprise and disappointment tonight to see a PowerPoint presentation on the board agenda where that recommendation had been reversed with no input or communication with community members who had put in all of that work. No transparency, no communication. At what point did this recommendation change? Um, and so that's, that's very frustrating. And I, I want the board to consider that the detriment of putting health in PE classes. You know, over my years teaching at this district, I've seen a lot of things change. I've seen health class removed in favor of geography, which is now gone. I've seen PE classes allowed to skyrocket into the 50s. I see administrators signing off on more and more PE waivers for students that should be enrolled in PE. And it really makes PE teachers feel often underappreciated in our subject area devalued from the top down due to years of getting no support and lowering our class size, the waivers being abused, the contract disregarded for class limits, and it's all at the detriment of our students. Um, when you put PE in, or health in PE, you are forcing PE teachers to teach curriculum that they are not credentialed to teach, and it results in, in delivering that information in a very fragmented and limited way if it's being taught at all, like Kim mentioned. Um, and it, all of this results in a loss of much needed um, and state mandated activity time. And we cannot do, I mean, health, there's no arguing that our kids need health, but they also need PE. And one should not come at the expense of the other. Prior to COVID, Napa County had been identified as the most obese county in the Bay Area with 50% of our county being pre-diabetic. Our kids need to move. They don't need to sit in a classroom and have health during their mandated physical fitness time. And um, I, I just really want people to consider when you put it in PE, then you're saying that, that uh, it's one or the other and they really need to have both. Our students deserve to have the full state mandated curriculum that they are entitled to receive in both subject areas. And we cannot abandon classes because some parents will complain about their students AP or the honors path or what will they take? We can problem solve those other areas, but our kids need this information and we need to prioritize how to deliver it to them as a real class by a credential teacher. Ms. Frankel, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next up is Kitty Aaron. Hello. I don't need to repeat what the other two said because I three sat on that committee for years and watched nothing get accomplished. And the same thing that was being said by some people here tonight. Um, to say that this class isn't necessary or we could just throw it in PE, um, that isn't happening. I have children that have not received health education in seventh grade or ninth grade. They are now in ninth grade and 12th grade and they received no health education, not even the minimum sex education while they were in middle school, didn't receive it. When I was in school, we had a full you know, health class and we had a person that came in for two weeks and taught sex ed, the minimum. Why can't we do that? We are not doing this. We are out of compliance. We keep checking boxes and it's not being done. So in 2016, the minimum was to have that sex education being taught. You know, I guess some people think it's being taught in PE. It is not. So don't dismiss it because some middle class white child wants to take AP classes. Sorry, our local health stats are clearly stating that we need health education 
more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Any additional comments, Mr. Reese? Yes, President Martin, um, we have Amy Martinson next. Hi, good evening. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking on this topic, but I feel compelled to. Um, I'm a high school counselor and I just wanna concur with the other speakers who say that the current model's not working. It definitely is not being taught uh, in PE classes. All the standards are not being covered. So um, there definitely needs to be a change, um, whether it's a standalone class or whether it's integrated uh, across subjects and across grade levels. Um, I can see pros and cons of both models, but something different has to take place. And if it's going to be integrated um, in different course areas across grade levels, there needs to be some accountability measure. Um, I remember in the past when sex ed uh, was taught, um, there was accountability um, and that's currently not happening. So um, definitely something needs to, to change as far as it being a standalone class and not knowing what to do with the other semester, um, there's been a lot of talk about requiring an ethnic studies class. And that I think would be perfectly suited to be the other semester in the ninth grade year. Um, if, if that's what's decided that um, health is gonna be a standalone class. Um, thank you. Okay, let's go with uh, Chris De Natale. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, thank you for having me tonight. My name is uh, Christopher De Natale. I'm the Executive Director of Arts Council Napa Valley, as well as a parent of an eighth grader and a 10th grader in the district. Um, I've uh, had the opportunity to talk to many of you about this issue, and I think what I'm gonna offer is the ability to take caution because Making this decision will have many unintended consequences, including an equity issue of not our middle class white students not having an opportunity to AP, but our underserved community having access to arts. I cannot stress enough the importance of arts in the area of mental health and the ability to have our students be able to take arts. As a parent of a ninth grader last year, I can tell you how confusing the system is. And as someone who's an advocate of arts and has a student who loves the arts, I came out of my first swing with no arts class for my son. So it's not an easy situation for us new ninth grade parents. And I think this is beyond important. I definitely respect Kim and Manya who have, uh, who have both taught my children uh, and appreciate that point of view. But again, I think we need to take pause revisit it and look at what we're going to do with this class if we're going to move forward. And if there's a better way to serve our students through finding a way to serve health through their four year experience as a ninth graders health needs could not be more different than a senior in high school. Uh, so I thank each and every one of you for taking the time to talk to me about this. I really, uh, I cannot thank uh, Assistant Superintendent Jennings enough for the amount of time she spent talking to me and my organization about this. But again, take pause because uh, this is a great solution for health, possibly, but what are the unintended consequences and how does this affect the student population going forward? So again, I thank you for your time. I appreciate your work. Uh, these public meetings are long and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. Have a great evening. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lisa Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. And thank you for your time. Um, I, I wanted to just share that um, I do agree with what Chris and um, Dean and Tali just shared. I also completely respect the time um, and honor the, the time that Manya and Kim have put into the task force. I would encourage the same to take pause to reassess the situation um, so that whatever the implementation ends up um, becoming, we are not, it is, it is that the impl implementation doesn't, um, the benefits don't outweigh the, um, I'm sorry, that the causes don't outweigh the benefits. Um, I, we need to step back and look at the students who will 
be negatively affected by a possible standalone um, class or even a two semester where um, that whole year is taken away from students who need to have an additional resource um, and allowed to be able to take a visual and performing arts or another elective that it does offer them emotional and mental health along with a family that they might not get in other areas of their life. I think there are some amazing workarounds that can be addressed and looked at, um, especially integrating health into um, curriculum, not just at the ninth grade level, but in the 10th, 11th and 12th grade level as implementation within other courses and also supplemented with um, specialists in mental health areas, in sexual education areas um, to support students and their growth from, from when they are ninth grader to when they're a 12th grader as their emotional needs and their physical needs are completely different at each age level. Um, thank you so much again for allowing me to speak and thank you so much for your time. Okay, um, Heidi Zippe. Hi there. Um, just thanks for thanks for your time on this too. And I'm just going to briefly echo the previous two um, speakers. Uh, we need to make sure that we maintain ability for our ninth grade students to have access to music and arts and other electives. And um, we need to recognize that, um, as the last two call, uh, speakers uh, represented, that if we put health class while I recognize the extreme importance of health class as a healthcare provider myself, mental health I think is best served sometimes with, with freshmen in having, um, in, as, as the previous speaker said, a family, a place, an interest um, in music or art or AVID that gets them to school in the first place. And if they're not at school, they're not gonna be getting their health education anyway. So I appreciate what uh, Trustee Gracia said um, about making sure we consider this. Um, when we look at how health can be implemented, but we certainly do not want to lose access to electives for our freshmen um, when they've are, it's already been lost for the most part for our sophomores. So um, please consider, and I appreciate the work of the Assistant Superintendent Andrew Jennings in um, thinking about this in different ways um, and possibly over the years of, um, of high school education instead of just a freshman year when it would eliminate another class being the electives that they that they have access to that are so very valuable. Uh, thank you all for your time and glad you're back in the boardroom. All right, uh, Karen Provenza. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to briefly say that uh, I really appreciate the the direction of having an opportunity to design a health curriculum that truly serves the physical and mental health needs of our students throughout their high school career without interfering with their ability to access electives. We know visual and performing arts support social and emotional values. Arts education reduces feelings of anxiety, depression, isolation, and it positively impacts all around academic performance. All students struggle throughout incredible challenges at this moment and access to arts is not a luxury, it's a tool for recovery. We have this opportunity to perhaps come up with the same solution that it moves out of PE and into a standalone class. But before we make that decision, we, know, we need to know how we are going to mitigate um, all the unintentioned and unintentional consequences of that decision. So let's take this time to develop the plan and make it very, very specific before we decide we're moving forward with something without uh, fully understanding how we're gonna make it fair and equitable. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I do really appreciate the fact that uh, you're delaying this decision so that we can think about it thoroughly.
And that concludes uh, our public comment at this time, President Martin. Thank you, Mr. Grace. Um, additional um, comments on the item? There, there was some talk over the last couple of years as we were talking about the, uh, the, need, the social emotional needs and the, uh, the, uh, the health ed discussion. Um, one of the points of emphasis that came up in the past was um, providing the kids with coping skills. And this was all pre-COVID, obviously. Um, <laughs> that that you know um you know giving the kids the background information the tools to you know set down their devices and sort of uh, uh step away and sort of gain a healthy perspective about adequate sleep adequate nutrition exercise all of that um so Something like that seems like a great way to go in through the ninth grade uh, so that they've got those tools for the whole four years. Um, the other thing I would observe taking sort of a longer view is we have passionate advocates for the arts, for ethnic studies, for health ed, for PE, and they all do an end run over the school board and go straight to the legislature, which doesn't exactly have an integrated <laughs> view on how to put together a master schedule. So it comes back to us to sort out. And I think that's where we find ourselves trying to sort out conflicting important things that our legislators were um, uh, received some uh, passionate advocacy. It felt good to pass a requirement, uh, but the details are left as an exercise for the reader. And uh, that's sort of what we're grappling with. Yes, while um, our speakers um, were talking, and um, I really appreciate Kim Whipple's comments because I know she did a very good job teaching health ed at Napa High. Um, Everybody said something uh, that I agreed with tonight, but I was just sitting here and made a little schedule figuring out, um, you know, how a person would take all the um, UC recommended courses, plus, you know, PE the first two years and maybe some sports and some music and some art. Okay, you see where we're going. We need a 10 period day, you know, for some of these hyper achievers and um, and your point is, you know, very well taken about the state legislature and their um, their uh, enthusiasms. I think you said yes. That's it. Their enthusiasms. And uh, it's. I mean, I'm just. I'm just looking at this. And hey, yeah, you need science is important. I think math is required. You need four years of English. And we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I mean, I'm pretty tired. <laughs> I was thinking, I haven't seen any of you all in months, in what, eight months or something like that? And, you know, I'm already tired of you. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, it's exhausting. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm i just looking at it, you know, from hours in the day. How do we do this? I'm open to suggestions. I was thinking, well, when I taught uh, The Great Gatsby, I always uh, pointed out that, um, a lot of these people were operating under the uh, influence of alcohol and they weren't making the best decisions, you know, so I suppose you can put health ed everywhere, but there's also a more scientific way to do it. Yeah, um, the last comment I'll add, and, and I do want to thank um, uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Pat Andrew Jennings, I, and I appreciate the shout outs from the public speakers um, for her as well, just being new into the position and walking into a scenario where the conversation has been happening for a while and um, final decisions haven't been made. So I do want to recognize um, the, the frustration um, of some of the speakers who were who are our teachers, our experts, and who participated um, on the task force for several years. And, you know, one of the things I've shared with the school board and the public various, uh, it, across various opportunities is that, you know, task force should really 
not go on for several years without an outcome. So I, I do want to just recognize that frustration and that's something that we're trying to change. And the circumstances are, of today were, you know, just completely due to unanticipated factors outside of our control. And so um, I, I trust uh, that the new team in the Instructional Services Division will work collaboratively to Trustee Jankwitz's question with our site level staff and our leaders at the high school level, teacher leaders, administrative leaders, curricular leaders um, to, you know, figure this dilemma out. It is, a, it is, a, it, they're tensions. They're tensions to be managed across um, uh, priorities that are important for all of our students. And so, you know, we, we, we appreciate the arts, we, we appreciate the health education. Um, so, you know, we appreciate your sustained patience as we work through this issue in NVUSD and now post the pandemic, hope to bring forth a solution um, in 22-23, um, as uh, Ms. Andrew Jennings has described. So um, we will get it done and this will not linger forever. So um, I, I can commit to sort of that big picture item um, and also just sort of apologize to people who've sat on task force and feel like there hasn't been an, a deliverable that's been executed on. So um, that's no longer our practice. And so um, this one just got cut up, caught up in, in an unusual set of circumstances. So, so thank you uh, for your commitment for staying up late with us tonight to comment on the issue, um, plus all your years of involvement and engagement. It's, it's uh, much appreciated and your leadership is, is very much welcomed and embraced. So I just wanted to add that I understand that health is quite important. Um, I don't devalue the lessons that we can learn from teaching students health class, but um, I think that waiting until their ninth grade year is certainly not doing them a lot of good for the first eight years, nine years of their educational experience by then many habits and um, potentially bad ones have already set in and become ingrained in the student's uh, routine and daily life. It, what we should be looking at is perhaps integrating health throughout the K through 12 education, I think, is, is probably where this needs to go so that we're training people from a young age to develop healthy habits and not hoping that a one semester class in their ninth grade year will suddenly be the panacea saving grace that will uh, wash away nine years of bad practices. I, it just doesn't seem realistic to me at the end of the day. So um, well, I think well, the integration I, is, is an important yeah, aspect of this. You know, this is prob probably the strongest area of partnership the community and the schools can, can find. There's nothing there's nothing that we can teach in the schools that'll survive not being reinforced at home. Uh, the partnership between the community and its schools becomes absolutely essential. Reading, writing, you know, my parents didn't, couldn't read English. I was fine. I learned how to read. I learned how to write uh, with their encouragement, but not, with not a lot of help, but it's in areas of health and mental health, both uh, nutrition uh, and mental health, where the partnership between uh, our parents and our schools absolutely has to be what created and then reinforced. Um, of all places, so when I was in rural Mexico a few years ago, I was invited was really a lot of fun. I was invited by the government of Mexico to review some educational reforms. Um, that partnership is what they were uh, 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 highlighting in that the, the, the local school systems were providing parents with training around reading, writing, and nutrition. And they had buses. And it was probably the strongest reform, educational reform, that had occurred in Mexico since the early 1920s. Mm. Um, and you know, you know, I don't know who got that brainstorm, but it, uh, that that great idea. And I don't know how we can do that, but you know, in search of lasting 
and valuable partnerships with our community and other agencies, this is certainly one that we can that we should we should work on. Yep, and I think the you know certainly the um, introduction of the healthy lunches at our schools is you know that's a very concrete expression of our interest in in health and the elimination of um, oh you know the delectable pizza and French fry lunches that used to abound. I mean you know we we're we're making a big effort, but um, I think. Uh, it's 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 a huge task. It's a huge task, and right now, and right now, I'm just not sure. Um, you know, we've we've got the bandwidth right now. Um, the funniest thing I saw when when Nancy and I were in Naples last year, the year before, was a pizza in Naples, just the home of first place of pizza. It was it was a pizza called Il Americano, and you'll never know what the topping was on Il Americano. Cheese whiz? French fries. French, French fries. fries. <laughs> My Lord. Stack. You mean freedom fries. <laughs> <laughs> French fries. So, you know, we have a bad reputation in the world about, about our, our eating habits. And I think that we can help address some of those, again, by, by forming strong partnerships with our community. Yeah. I do think it speaks to the importance of having health integrated in a, in a multifaceted way into not only the ninth grade curriculum, but the integration say, that it takes place in whatever form throughout. I would say probably one of the most valuable community uh, uh, gifts that the district has given to, to Napa and the children is to feed them during the pandemic. Because the, the, while, while I was with Canvey, just the sight of, or just knowing how food was almost considered a privilege in some places within our community was enough to, to drive me crazy. Um, the, even, even recently, the fact that the city would not allow uh, for traffic parking in front of the food bank because it affected other businesses, but wouldn't allow access to the food bank. So people couldn't drive through to pick up boxes of food because you know, that affected the businesses on Main Street. So you know, somebody has to do something and, and, and NVUSD did it. Uh, I, I'll just end with, because I'll be remiss as a chair of the first five commission. If you really want to go preventive, you want to go with the first five. Mm -hmm. and everything that encompasses in supporting that, that child's life, which is the, 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 the health and wellness component of it, the child development component of it, and the family strengthening component of it. And that is a community-wide issue. And that a, requires a systemic change. And this community has not put our zero to five in its number one priority. And, and you can see that in the budgets and you can see that in the programs and you can see that in however you want to see that. So I, I, I think that's, um, you know, you, you talk about minimum wage. I mean, all, just all of those components really impact what really um, data shows in our county as your social determinants of health. And, and that um, really requires a systemic change and that's a long time but the NVUSD has a voice at the table. And that's one thing that we keep pushing, right? And, and, and but we're, we're tackling so much here. It's so hard to, to be at every um, committee or at every, at every meeting, but um, our voice is so strong that it is um, needed to be at the table when it comes to discussions like that. So I'll end it there. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Would anybody like to move to extend the meeting now so we can go through the um, action items? Is so moved. Second. The first by Mr. David Gracia and a second by Ms. Gonzalez Mares. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nays? Aye. Abstentions? I think we need to name a specific time. We only get to extend it once. So 
So I'm going to suggest midnight, not that I'm hoping we go there. <laughs> But <laughs> to stay within the confines of our bylaws. Of course. We so discussed that at the policy meeting. So yeah. Thank you, Joe. If we have the time, we could certainly fill it in. <laughs> so we're extending David and Alba till 12. Some That's fine. <laughs> and um, <laughs> student representative. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So we move to action items, K1A general services, K1A adoption of revised Napa Valley Unified School District governance handbook. So moved. Second. First by David Gracias, second by Mr. Joe Shunk. Do I have any public comment on this item? There are no public comments on this item, President Martin. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Nays? Abstentions? Student body? Hi. Thank you. Thank you. K1B agreement with Hannah Long Design. So moved. Second. First by David Grasses, second by Mr. Joe Shunk. Do I have any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nays? Abstentions? Student body? Hi, thank you. K2 business and operations, K2A purchase of 2000 Samsung Chromebooks from Staples Technology Solutions. So moved. Second. First by Ms. Water and a second by Mr. Gracia. Do I have any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nays, abstentions? Student representative, aye. Thank you. K2B, purchase of 200 MacBook Airs from Apple. So moved. Second. First by Ms. Water, a second by Mr. Shunk. Do I have any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. So I do have a comment on this item. Okay. Uh, I'm concerned, I'm renewing basically my concern from a couple times ago when we purchased the 700 MacBook Airs, I have still the same concerns that we're wasting money by buying the Apple products, which come at a premium. You can get the same um, PC for several hundred dollars less per PC. So I, I think that this is not a good expenditure of money. And additionally, the peripherals for uh, these MacBooks are hard to find and are more expensive because of the little used uh, USB connection that is the only connector on it. And I think that the 13 inch screen is quite small and that's difficult to utilize when we're doing so much distance learning. Um, so I, I think that we could be purchasing either more powerful uh, machines for the same price or equivalent uh, we equipped machines for a lower price. Thank you, Mr. Gracia. So I have a first by Mr. Water and Mrs. and Mr. Shunk. Sorry, I couldn't read my writing. <laughs> Do I have any uh, any other public comment? There are no public no comments public for this item. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions? Nays? Nay. Student representative? Aye. K3A? So moved. Second. A first by Mr. Shunk and a second by Ms. Water. Do I have public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nays? Abstentions? Student body? Aye. Okay. K3B resolution 2108 to eliminate classified positions. So moved. Second. First by Mr. Gracia and a second by Mr. Shunk. Roll call, please. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez Mares. Aye. Trustee Jankowitz. 
Trustee Water? Aye. Trustee Hurtado? Aye. Trustee Shunk? Aye. Trustee Gracia? Aye. Student Board Member Magana? Aye. Thank you. K-4 Instructional Services, K-4A High School Basic Instructional Materials Adoption. So moved. First by Mr. Gracia. Second. Second by Mr. Shunk. Do I have any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions? Nays? Student body? Aye. Okay. K-4B? Agreement between Napa Valley Unified Dist School District and CARE Solis. So moved. Second. First by Mr. Gracia, second by Ms. Gonzalez Mares. Do I have any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays, abstentions, and student body? Aye. Thank you. K4C, Memorandum of Understanding between Howell Mountain Elementary School District and Napa Valley Unified School District. So moved. Second. First by Mr. Gracia, second by Mr. Shunk. Do I have any public comment? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstentions? Nays? Student representative? Aye. Okay, K4D, Crescendo Education Group Agreement. So moved. Second. I have a first by Mr. Gracian, a second by Ms. Jankowicz. Uh, do I have any public comment on this item? I'm sorry, we're freezing up here. But <laughs> there are no public comment for this item, President Martin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Reese. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? Nays? Uh, student body? Aye. Please excuse my laughter. I'm, it's a nervous laugh because I'm cold. <laughs> okay, K5A, um, SPC 12.17-20, request for special inspection services for the Vintage High School Athletic Field Path of Travel with CTS. So moved. Second. <laughs> a first by Mr. Gracia, a second by Ms. Jankowitz. Um, any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays, abstentions, and student body? Aye. Thank you. K5B SPC 18.21-20, request for a hazardous material survey at Napa High School gym window project with Pyramid Environmental. So moved. Second. First by Ms. Water, a second by Mr. Gracia. Um, any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm gonna throw you off. Student representative? Aye. Nays, abstentions, <laughs> motion carries. Uh, K5C, um, SPC 19.11-20, request for topographic survey services at the American Canyon Middle School Student Commons Project by, please remind me the name. Chaudhry. Chaudhry and Associates. So moved. Chaudhry. Um, so moved. A, a, I have second. a first by Ms. Gonzalez Mares and a second by Mr. Gracia. That's the way I heard it come out, correct? Uh, you were correct. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nays? Abstentions? And student body? Aye. <laughs> yes, it is. K5D. SBC 38-55-16, request for appraisal services for Napa Junction Elementary Project. So moved. Second. 
<laughs> so I have a first by Mr. Joe Shunk and a second by Mr. Gracia. Uh, do I have public com comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nays? Abstentions? Student body? Aye. Thank you. Okay, informational. Items under this section do not require board action. Business and operations, O1A 2019 20 pupil attendance rates. L1A 2019 20 pupil attendance rates. Do I have any public comment on this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. Okay. L1B September 2020 investment report. Do I have any public comment? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. There are no public comments for this item. L1C, Verizon cell tower agreement. Uh, Trustee Martin, I do have something right. to read out for this item. Is it for L1C, is this correct? Yes, Verizon cell tower. Okay. Uh, NBUC received a request from the Napa uh, Neighborhood Association for Safe Schools to provide a copy of Verizon's liability insurance for the cell phone tower located near Napa High. Uh, in the MNO yard. Uh, after providing with this, them with the certificate, they contended that the insurance certificate was invalid and then we had the ability to terminate the contract before the fifth year. I brought up their concerns with our legal counsel who does not agree. Subsequent to providing them with the insurance certificate, the Napa Neighborhood Association for Safe Technology requested that we list the Verizon cell tower contract as an item at a future board meeting. We, we informed them of this on October 8th, 18th that this item would be on tonight's agenda. The purpose of tonight's informational item is to satisfy the request by the Napa Neighborhood Association for Safe Technology to list Verizon on a future agenda. NBUSD approved a contract with Verizon to lease land for the installation of a cell phone tower on January 21st, 2016. Uh, due to community input, the board uh, voted to rescind the lease on May 16th, 2016. Verizon filed a notice of motion of preliminary injunction on September 13th, 2016. Uh, on April 20th, 2017, the board voted to approve a settlement agreement with Verizon. As a result, NBUSD allowed Verizon to move forward with the installation of the cell phone tower. The first payment from Verizon was deposited on June, thir June 30th, 2017. NBUSC receives $30,000 annually in lease payments. NBUSC recently uh, asked our legal counsel to reanalyze the contract to determine if the district has the ability to terminate the contract. It was determined, determined that terminating the contract is at the sole discretion of Verizon. With this said, the district will send Verizon a letter requesting that the contract be terminated at their discretion. A copy of the letter to Verizon requesting that the contract be terminated, our attorney opinion, and the April 20th, 2017 settlement agreement is attached to this item tonight. Thank you. So for our discussion, I just wanted to highlight, because I've gotten a lot of emails on this issue, uh, that we did send to Verizon a letter requesting that the contract be terminated. So that was done. And I feel like a lot of people were missing that line in this, um, this, this uh, line item here. We did send a copy and it's attached of a letter to Verizon requesting that the contract be terminated. That's true. Do I have any public comment on this item? We do have a public comment, President Martin. Have a public comment, President Martin. Thank you. Uh, Valerie Wolf. Yes, hi, Valerie Wolf. Um, good evening, board. And I'm a co coordinator for the Napa Neighborhood Association for Safe Technology. Uh, thank you for placing the agreement that permitted Verizon 
cell tower on the Napa High School campus on the agenda for discussion. On March 20th, 2016, MVUSD entered into an agreement with GTE MobileNet of California, which stated it was, in quotes, doing business as, unquote, or was a DBA for Verizon Wireless to lease a portion of the Napa High School campus for a 50-foot cell tower. After receiving complaints from neighbors and staff, the district attempted to rescind the lease agreement. And when Verizon filed a court action for breach of contract, the district signed a settlement agreement on uh, April 6, 2017, allowing for the installation of the tower. Through our work with the city of Napa on 28 4G, 5G ready cell antenna, uh, the city approved in 2019, we discovered that similar to the city, the district's agreement with Verizon and the accompanying certificate of insurance was never valid to begin with. Verizon Wireless is not registered to do business in the state of California and has not filed as a DBA for GTE MobileNet of California. Therefore, both the agreement and certificate of insurance are invalid. In addition, uh, we informed the district that GTE MobileNet signed the lease agreement, yet Verizon Wireless provided the certificate of insurance. Today, the district provided us a new certificate of insurance with GTE MobileNet named as the insured. While this is a step in the right direction toward protecting the district, it still does not change the fact that the entire agreement is predicated on the idea that GTE MobileNet is a DBA for Verizon Wireless, but it is not. Uh, these two corporations have been engaging in a shell game that is, in effect, makes neither one a responsible party to the agreement. This afternoon, our attorney, Mark Pollack, sent an email to Mr. Mangawala stating that he will submit additional materials tomorrow, materials that, quote, place the district on notice of significant potential liability, not only on the insurance issue, end quote. So the district can consider these materials he requested that the agreement be re-agendized at a future board meeting. Education code 17527 and 17538 disallow the leasing of district property if it will unduly disrupt residents in the surrounding neighborhood or jeopardize the safety of school children. A cell tower on a school campus does both. We understand the situation is not the current administration's doing. However, it is now the current administration and board's problem to deal with to protect students, staff, and neighbors and to avoid significant liability. It merits further research and discussion by the board. We echo attorney Mark Pollack's request and ask the board to direct the superintendent to review and consider the materials he will provide tomorrow and bring the item back at a future board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Do we have additional comments? We do, we have uh, one more, Amy Martinson. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good evening, board. Thank you for revisiting the issue of the cell tower on the Napa High campus. I am an employee at Napa High, and while I love working at Napa High, I don't love working so close to a cell tower. As someone who has seen the list of more than a thousand studies linking radio frequency or RF radiation to a myriad of negative health effects, including cancer, I have taken steps to reduce my exposure to RF radiation at home by only using wired connections. I am thankful that at work, most of the time I'm in the office using wired connections. Still, the cell tower is there putting out RF radiation, not for an educational purpose, but for money. In 2011, IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, a branch of the World Health Organization, reviewed the research literature and declared RF radiation a group 2B or possible human carcinogen. Lead is in the same category. Experts believe that if IARC reviewed the peer-reviewed literature available since 2011, that it would be bumped up to a group 2A or probable human, human carcinogen, the same category as Roundup herbicide, or perhaps to an even higher category. We know that children are at greater risk than adults when exposed to any carcinogen. I have looked at the agreement uh, and the $3 million for bodily injury per claim would be a drop in the bucket should a student, staff member, or neighbor come forward with a cancer claim alleging the cell tower caused their cancer. The school groundskeeper who won the first trial against Monsanto alleging Roundup caused his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was awarded $20.5 million. 
The Napa Neighborhood Association for Safe Technology has provided the board with a legitimate issue that calls into question the validity of the agreement and a possible way out of an ill-conceived contract the district should have never entered into. I hope the board will use this information and pursue every angle possible to protect students and staff from unnecessary RF radiation. At a minimum, the district should require GTE MobileNet to file as a DBA for Verizon Wireless. Lastly, I saw online from a year ago a petition regarding the cell tower with 200 signatories. I would like to read a few comments with my remaining time. Let's see. The first one is from Neil Water. Quote, there are no studies showing the safety of RF radiation. The second one, Robin Rao, childhood cancer in Napa is the highest in the state. Stop. Uh, Charlie Toledo, health concerns should override commercial concerns, especially for exposure to children. So I'm going to run out of time. I'd just like to say that while I appreciate the letter to Verizon, I don't think they're willingly going to uh, take down their cell tower. I, I think it's wise to listen to what attorney Mark Pollack has to say in his letter to you tomorrow and to consider revisiting this topic at a future meeting. Thank you. That concludes our comment for this item, President Martin. Thank you, Mr. Voice. Additional comments? Okay, so we haven't received a letter from um, Mr. Pollock yet. Did you, I haven't seen it. Uh, no, no, we haven't. So this is, uh, he offered me a uh, day this afternoon, so around two o'clock. We didn't hear you, Mr. Mayor. We have not received a letter. Um, and like I, I couldn't I, find Mr. Manguala, we could not hear I didn't you. get that. Like Mr. I said Manguala? in my earlier, I'm having uh, internet problems. One second. Um, like I said in my earlier statement, we have not received that yet. So once I receive it, I will forward it to the trustees. Okay, let's see. Okay, moving on to L1D, inter district agreement. Mr. Reese, do I have any um, a public comment for this item? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. Okay. So when I looked at the report, there's a pretty precipitous drop from Vallejo City Unified in Fairfield Sassoon. And I, I just wanted to ask staff if they have any estimation of how much of this is COVID related and how much of it is perhaps employment related because a lot of our inner districts are driven by parents who have jobs in the inside the school district area. Uh, so their kids come to our schools uh, and with the uh, upset in employment patterns, whether that's reflective, because 131 kids that were here in the spring, last time we did the report uh, versus now, that's on the order of about a million three. Mm -hmm. Mr. Manguala, do you have information around the why um, on the drop of the inners, or is it just the assumption that this is COVID related and employment related? I, I think that this, that is a about. I, I think that this, that is a. We didn't hear you. Can you say it again, please? I think that that is a valid assumption that is most likely employment related. We do not have access to those types of records, but it, I would imagine that it's very closely related to some of the data that I provided earlier about how the, the economic impact of COVID-19 is impacting people uh, differently. Additional comments? L1E enrollment report. Do I have public comment on this item, Mr. Ruiz? There are no public comments for this item, President Martin. Okay. 
Thank you. Comments from the board? Okay. L2, L2A, human resources, quarterly report on Williams uniform complaints. Who's the, she didn't say anything? No, okay. Just information. Okay, thank you. Public comment, Mr. Ruiz. <clears throat> there are no public comments for the cider and President Martin. Right, thank you very much. Good job on once again having zero complaints. <laughs> like zero there. Point out that Williams report is only half a report. They didn't do the physical inspection because we weren't open and they weren't getting anywhere near us. So the county <laughs> office is going to be poking around in a sample of our classes. So. <laughs> Zero's a zero though, right, Trustee? Yes. Yes. Take no, take yes. no win, Joe. Yes, take it is. no win. <laughs> I just um, heard the other half of the Williams report last week. So I, Oh, I at the NCOE board yeah. meeting? Mm -hmm. I am going to move for M additional suggestions and comments from board members and superintendent. Any other comments? Just that um, you're going to let us know when uh, the when Verizon responds to the letter we sent out the other day. Yeah, we will follow up. Okay. With the board, and I just want to congratulate the board. I know we had some technical difficulties today with the sound a little bit, um, but we did just complete our first hybrid board meeting. So. <laughs> and it's great to see you all. I was just teasing. And it's not midnight. So we'll, we'll work on improving any of these sound issues tonight and do some fine tuning for our, our December board meeting. Sounds good. Future agenda items? Yes. I was hoping to get a little more information on food service. I know in the past that it has encroached on the general budget. And I would like to know more about how the department is operating. I would like to hear about how the cost of meals produced has changed over time starting in early 2019 and continuing through the present school year. I would also like to know the number of meals sold each month and how that has changed since the beginning of 2019 to the present and what our school lunch profitability has looked like month by month since 2019 to the present. Uh, we've had a lot of changes that have happened from everything from moving to our new model to having more finishing kitchens come online, to starting COVID service, to suspending service, to going to, you know, back to in-person a bit and having more meals consumed. So I just, I want to get some idea of what's been happening at the end of the day with our food service. Yeah. I mean, didn't we just hire her today? We hired her today, right? Yeah, you did right. hire her. Today. Okay, uh, Trustee Grasso. So you're interested mostly in the financial side? Yes, I'm just kind of interested to see what's been sort of happening there. Okay. I will. If any other future agenda items? I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. A first by Mr. Hurtado and a second by Mr. Shunk. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Student body? Aye. On the Thank next you. one, they should be able to first and second at all. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>